Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to class. And after today, the class is half over. Goes awfully quick, doesn't it? Yep. Class is half over. All right. Did you guys do your reading for chapter four? Okay. Did you grade your test on page 184? All right, when I call your name, if you can tell me your scores, please. Victoria? Janelle? Elizabeth? Pass, Pass? okay. Uh, Kiera? Neftali? Pass. Okay. Paula? Isabel? 95. Thank you. Andrea? Thank you, Cassidy. Okay, Gazelle. Lacey. Uh, I missed one. Thank you, and Queenie. All right. Any questions on any of that, on what you read? Anything that you don't understand? Good morning, Marie. Thank you for joining us. The first question? Okay, let me go to that page because I don't know all the questions by heart. Oh, which system coordinates all body functions? Um, that's going to be your nervous system. Your nervous system is your brain and spinal cord, but it's responsible for everything else in your body. It's the control center. So like your liver can't work without your brain. Your brain has to tell it what to do. Your kidneys aren't going to work without your brain. Your brain has to tell them what to do. So the brain really is the kind of central command of the body. Um, and that's why dementia right? Dementia is a problem with the brain. The brain is not working right. So with dementia, if the brain controls everything, right? And we have dementia, which means our brain is broken. That means dementia is going to affect every part of you because the organ that controls every part of you is what is in trouble. Does that make sense? So dementia patients will forget how to eat. They'll forget how to go to the bathroom. They'll forget how to talk. They'll forget how to walk. They'll forget how to um, basically do everything. So they end up um, total care, unable to uh, care for themselves in any way. Does that help? We're going to go through each of these body parts or body systems now. We're just going to do a very small, quick review of what you went over in chapter four in your reading. And the reason that I do this, I don't do this with the other chapters, but I do for chapter four. And good morning. And the reason that I do that is because as a CNA, you don't need to know the body systems that well. You don't need to know what organs make up the digestive system. It's not going to be on your test. That's not what the test is about. That's not your role. Okay, your role is to read and follow the care plan. But you do need to have kind of an awareness that there are body systems. And when something goes wrong in a body system, it's going to affect other systems. So like if we have um, let's say we have a tornado go through right here. Now, right here is affected, but it's going to throw debris across the street in Timber Pines, you know, over north of it. It's going to throw debris everywhere. So other cis or other areas would be affected. Even though they didn't get hit, they're going to be affected. Well, our body systems are like that too. If something goes wrong in a body system, 
other systems may be affected. So we want to go through each of these body systems and kind of talk about them a little bit. But we also need to understand, this is kind of the real, um, this is what chapter four was really trying to get to, is that as we age, our brain ages. So does our heart. So does our liver. So does our skin. And we talked about skin changes, right? And how that affects your temperature perception. Remember that? So each one of these body systems is going to have some changes uh, related to aging. So I want to go through those as well. That's really what you need to know about chapter four in your reading is how each of those body systems are affected by aging, because that's who we're really going to be taking care of the most. Okay. So the nervous system, which is where we started this morning, is made up of the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves. Okay. So control center of the body controls everything. But as it ages, we're going to see some very specific effects. Your um, senses are going to be diminished. So like sight gets impaired, can't see as well. And I'm kind of getting there. It's getting hard to see small print, right? The sight is affected. Um, hearing becomes affected. So particularly hearing in the higher ranges. So most of us have higher voices. And if our patients have diminished hearing because the hearing sense has aged, they may not be able to hear you clearly. Now, shouting at them just raises your voice higher into another octave. So instead of shouting at somebody that's having difficulty, difficulty hearing you, you lower your voice to a lower octave. Make sure you're facing them so they can read your lips and see your, your facial expressions and body language as well. So if I have somebody that is hard of hearing, instead of shouting at them, hey, it's time to go to lunch, they probably weren't going to hear that because my voice rose. Instead, I would say, Henry, it's time to go to lunch now. Can you follow me? So I lowered the pitch of my voice and spoke directly at the patient. Make sense? Okay. But there's other senses as well. Taste is another sense that diminishes with age. And a lot of times um, older people will stop eating foods that they enjoyed their entire life, like their favorite foods, just simply because they don't taste the same. Okay. That's a, a condition or that's a, an effect of aging. And then you've got things like sensation, right? that touch is a sense. So if all of our senses are decreasing because our nerves are getting older, they don't work as well, our brain is older, it doesn't process sensation as well, now we have somebody that may not be able to feel when they're walking if the ground is even. They may not be able to feel the pen when they pick it up and things tend to drop. So the risk of injury increases. Does that make sense? Okay. Decreased coordination kind of goes along with this with slowed reflexes as well. So this is why a lot of our older individuals um, are fall risks because they're not as coordinated and their reflexes aren't as active. So if they um, start to stumble, they may not be able to write themselves or they may not put their feet flat when they're walking. They may start walking on the edge of their feet which again, makes them a fall risk. Memory impairment can happen um, and decrease concentration as well. So if you're talking to an older person and you're going on and on and on and making the, the um, instructions really, really long, like I wouldn't go up to somebody and say, okay, it's uh, time to get ready for the day. So we're gonna go start with brushing your teeth and then I'm gonna take you into the shower and then we're gonna get dressed. What do you wanna wear today? What socks do you wanna wear? What shoes do you want to wear? And expect him to remember what I said in the beginning. It's way too many instructions. Their concentration may not be able to follow all of that. So if we have somebody that's aging and showing signs of memory impairment, it's up to us to address our communication for that patient. Make sense? 
Okay. Cardiovascular system, this is the heart and the blood vessels. It's also going to age in the body. And you're going to get decreased in endurance. Blood pressure usually rises as we age because the inside of the arteries get filled up with gunk. Just normal aging stuff. It's like your pipes in your house. When your house is first built, those pipes are crystal clean. But years of putting you know, food particles and stuff down the drain, those pipes get a little icky, right? A little corroded. Well, it's just same thing with your arteries. Prolonged bleeding because we often, our platelet counts start to decrease as we get older. We just don't make the blood cells the way we used to and fragile vein walls. So these patients are much more likely to bruise easily. Something as simple as grabbing a patient's arm where it may not hurt you at all, right, to grab your arm to help you somewhere. If I've got somebody who has prolonged bleeding and fragile vein walls and, um, you know, decreased fat, which is a protective layer, grabbing their arm can leave huge bruises on them, even though I did not mean to hurt them. Does that make sense? So with older individuals, we have to recognize this and make sure that we're being extra gentle, okay? Respiratory system is also affected by aging. Our lung volume decreases. So we can't take in as much breath when we, <sighs> our uh, muscles don't expand as well. Our lungs can't fill as well. Gas exchange doesn't happen as well. So this is why your patients are often out of breath, walking a very short distance when they're elderly. So they have decreased endurance from the heart, right? The heart's not pumping effectively. And we have decreased lung volume. Um, shortness of breath is common, especially on exertion, walking. Endocrine system is affected by aging in very large ways. Um, endocrine system is responsible for hormone production. Hormones control everything in your body. I know we think about hormones in adolescence, right? <laughs> adolescents are ruled by hormones. And those are the hormones we think about when I say the word hormones. But those are actually just one type of hormone in the body. As important as they are, the other hormones in your body are actually way more important. Things like thyroid that affects your metabolism, things like insulin that affects your ability to process glucose, sugar, and break it down into glucose, um, pituitary. Hi, um, you've got a million hormones in your body and they all regulate different processes. Melatonin helps you sleep. Sure. Melatonin helps you sleep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So lots and lots of different uh, hormones in the body. You're not responsible for knowing what they are or what they do unless you get into nursing. When you get into nursing, you have to learn all about all of them. But as a CNA, they're not going to ask you questions on the state exam about this. But you do need to know that um, hormone uh, production does decrease with aging. You need to know that because that's going to cause things like sleep dis disruptions, temperature regulation issues. We already have that with our lack of um, under skin fat. Now we've got a hormone problem that's going to affect that as well. Decreased bone density is a big one. A lot of our older women are going to have brittle bones because the bones, the density, the thickness of the bones um, the hormones that regulate that, they decrease. So if this older woman falls, not only is she going to end up bruised, but she's more predisposed to break something, a leg, a hip, an arm, a wrist. So preventing falls is super important in the elderly. And a um, reduced metabolic rate. So they're not going to um, burn fuel in their body as efficiently, which means that their body temperature is going to drop. Um, they may not be hungry because they're not clearing that food. They may only eat two very small meals a day and say, no, nah, I'm good. 
and well, iron level would be regulated by all the metabolic processes. It's also going to be regulated by your digestive system and how well it can break down the proteins to remove the iron. So all of that is going to be affected. Yes. Yes. Urinary system is also affected by aging. The bladder doesn't hold as much. <laughs> it's just just doesn't hold like it used to. So that means your patients are going to have to go to the bathroom way more often. And you need to understand that because the patient, you've got a job to do. You are running around like a chicken with your head cut off. And your patient is going to ring the call light in the middle of all that and say, I have to go to the bathroom. And you are going to get frustrated because I just took you 30 minutes ago. Well, it's not their fault. They can't hold it for eight hours like you can because the bladder itself, the muscle itself just doesn't stretch. It doesn't hold as much. The valve at the bottom that keeps the urine in the bladder doesn't work as effectively. It doesn't hold as tightly. So there's a lot of problems that can happen here. Um, you can end up with bladders that don't get completely emptied because our bladder can't kind of squeeze the last drop out. So when they're done peeing, there's still some in there. So it doesn't take long to fill up again. You guys see how that could be a problem? So expect your older patients to have to toilet more often than you do. And usually they need a little help because of that decreased coordination and all those other things that go along with it. The integumentary system, we talked about this already. Integumentary system is the skin, hair, and nails. Uh, Lewis Lucky says, good morning. First time logging in, loving the online course. Oh, thank you, Lewis. I appreciate that. So um, the skin is going to change in a lot of different ways. It becomes thinner. It becomes drier. The nails become brittle, which is why we only um, file in one direction on the nails. We have a decrease in subcutaneous fat. We already had a whole lesson on that. We have changes in hair color. Yeah, we start to lose the coloring in our hair in a lot of cases, and it turns gray or white. Um, decreased hair production, so that thick, wonderful head of hair that you have now will probably start to decrease as you age. And darker pigmented age spots are very, very common because instead of the um, melanin, which is what controls the color of your skin, Instead of it being nice and even and spread out everywhere, it kind of gets stuck in spots and they congregate and you end up with dark spots like this, right? Just areas that were never there before and all of a sudden they're just like big freckles that just show up. What happened? Well, that's all that melanin that's getting stuck in one place and it causes age spot. It doesn't spread out the way it used to. That's also considered liver spots. Right, correct. The other name for that. Remember in healthcare, we never have one name for anything. It's always two, right? So liver spots would be another word for that. Uh, reproductive system, of course, is affected by aging. And because of the decreased hormone production, we can have night sweats and uh, difficulty sleeping and irritability and hot flashes and all the things that happen during the change. Um, but you also end up with decreased moisture production. So they're not going to sweat as much as you do. You end up with um, things like erectile dysfunction and thinner, drier vaginal skin. This is important when we're cleaning the vaginal area to understand that that skin is thinner and drier and doesn't have the natural moisture production. So we need to be very gentle. Um, decreased fertility as well goes along with that. The gastrointestinal system is made up of the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, the intestines, the liver, and the colon. And this is definitely affected by aging. Um, there's lots of things. This is probably the, the one thing that your patient will absolutely um, talk about with aging. They're not going to want to eat as often. They're not going to get as much enjoyment from eating. They're not going to eat as much. Smaller portions are very, very common. Um, they may not even show any interest in eating. Like, you know, it's time for lunch, Mary. And 
don't really want to go. But you also have delayed gastric emptying. And that's super important for you to understand because whatever we put in the stomach, where you might be able to clear it in an hour or so, and you know, now the food is moving through your digestive system, this food is just going to kind of sit there and not move very well for hours. And then that starts to ferment. And the patient can end up with excess gas. Um, they can end up with a feeling of fullness that keeps them from eating or drinking. So dehydration becomes a very big concern among the elderly. So there's a lot of, of problems here, but the probably the most common problem that you're going to hear from your patients is constipation. Very, very common in the elderly. In fact, most elderly get hyper fixated on their bowel habits. Um, very common. And the reason for that is they're usually not drinking as much. The food isn't moving through the intestinal system as well. Their reflexes, their thirst reflexes are diminished. See how all of that plays together, right? But a big, big part of how food moves through your intestine system has to do with activity. Because your intestines, this right here, your intestines, they're smooth muscle. They don't really contract much on their own. So food doesn't like move through that muscle, that those intestines on its own. It, it doesn't like contract to push stuff where it needs to go. Your body relies on your abdominal muscles when you're walking, sitting, laughing, talking, that's all working these abdominal muscles and that the working of the abdominal muscles is what pushes food through your system. So now if we have an older person sitting in a wheelchair in a hallway, not active, and we know that their stomach has decreased emptying, slowed metabolism. So everything's just kind of sitting there. It's not going to move through because they're not active. It's not going to move through the intestinal system and they're likely to develop constipation. And this can be very, very uncomfortable for your patients. So most of your older patients are going to be predisposed to constipation. This is why in most cases we encourage fluid intake. Every time you walk by an older person, you should ask, have you taken a drink this hour? Would you like a cup of water? We want to really encourage that fluid, but we also don't want to stick somebody in bed and leave them there because then their abdominal muscles aren't moving at all. This is why activity is so important in the elderly. Does that make sense? This is super important. We also have decreased nutrient absorption, which means the food they eat we're not going to get as many nutrients out of. So malnourishment can be very common in older individuals. And then we have the musculoskeletal system. Good morning. And this is the bones, the muscles, the ligaments, the tendons, the cartilage. And this is affected. Your muscle mass decreases, so they're not as strong. They don't have the endurance. Um, they may not even be able to support their own weight anymore by standing. Um, we have inflammation of joints that's very common because the cartilage is worn down. That's called arthritis. And lack of coordination and instability puts them at risk for falls. So do you see how all of these things work together to put our patients, our older patients at risk? And that's what I need you to understand is that older people are not just advanced versions of you. They have totally different bodies than you do. The aging process changes the bodies significantly. So if you think to yourself, oh, they don't need to go to the bathroom. They just went 20 minutes ago and I'm good for eight hours. You are judging that from your body, which is completely different than an aging body. So you need to keep that in mind. That's what chapter four is all about, to understand that the aging body is completely different than yours. Okay, good. You also have the lymphatic system and that handles excess fluid. It just doesn't work well. So we end up with um, 
lower extremity swelling and aging quite often. All right, so let's review the skills that we learned so far. Remember that a pulse is a measurement of how many times the heart beat over one minute, right? So um, when we're taking the pulse, that means the reading always has to reflect how many times the heart beat over one minute. Doesn't matter how long you count, it's reported over one minute. What's a normal pulse rate? 60 to 100. And when we're taking a pulse, what is it important that we support? The arm, the elbow, right? You don't just want it hanging out there. Um, what fingers do we use to take a pulse? Okay, index and middle. What finger do we not use to take a pulse? Your thumb. Where is a radial pulse located? Yep, the top of the thumb side of the wrist. Very good. Very good. And how many um, evaluators do we count with? Two. two. In Florida, it's two. How do they know when we start counting? You're going to say start. How do they know when we stop? Okay. And how long does the care plan tell you to count for, for this skill, for the test? One minute. One minute. Because we counted something, what do we have to do afterwards? Document it. Good. All right. Dressing a resident with a weak arm is another skill that we learned. How do we know, how do we remember which side we undress first? USA first. What does USA first stand for? Undress strong arm first. Why? Because then you can just slide the you can be gentle with the weak arm. Very good. Yeah, the garment just slides right off. Super gentle. It makes it easier. Absolutely. So what do we want to ask the patient before we dress them? Okay, we're going to ask permission. What else do we need to know? Yeah, what, what they want to wear. Do we get to choose? No. If it's something that doesn't match, you can make a suggestion. That's okay. But we're ultimately going to honor their wishes. Okay. When do we get those clothing, that clothing, before or after we undress the patient? Before. Why? They're not uncomfortable. Yeah, they're not naked. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. When we lift an extremity, how do we lift? From above? From below with a flat palm. Very good. Very good. Um, we don't want to overextend or force movement. Why would that be important? The yeah, the broken foot. Yeah, absolutely. Don't force movement. Don't um, move joints unnaturally. Another one that's very, very common, CNAs do this all the time, and it makes me just want to, mm. when you're putting clothing on a patient, particularly long sleeves, right? because they usually have cuffs or buttons or something, it's very easy for that thumb to get bent backwards. And that can cause significant pain. It can tear all the tendons in there. It can actually dislocate that joint or even break the bone. So we have to be super careful not to let that thumb get hyperextended in the wrong direction. So pay attention to the thumb. It happens way more than you realize. And remember, our bones are brittle. Our muscles are less elastic. So we end up with usually a joint that will not heal for the rest of their life. And that's a horrible thing to do to somebody. Okay, so be careful there. Um, after we put the clothing on, we want to adjust it. Why? How should they look? Yeah, neat, clean, appropriate. Absolutely. Make sure that the buttons line up. It's not all cattywampus, right? Make sure the pants are up over the hips at the natural waist. Absolutely. Where do we put our soiled items? Do we just leave them on the table? Okay, soiled utility or the hamper or whatever. Okay. Um, oh, let me go back real quick. And which hand does the call light need to go into? the stronger hand. So that's important. Give me just a second, guys. I've got some, somebody is trying to get in touch with me here. 
Okay. That's fine. All right. Just want to make sure that we're broadcasting. Okay. Hand and nail care. This is a trick question. Easy answer. How many hands do we wash? Easy. And what's our easy answer in this class? The care plan. Care plan. Right. So how many hands do we wash? Whatever the care plan says. Easy answer. Don't forget your care plan. When you start getting into the steps of the skill, you tend to push that care plan right out of your head. Remember, we follow the care plan. Absolutely. So we're going to wash one hand because that's what our care plan tells us to. We're always going to support the wrist at all times as we're moving the hand, right? We're going to soak the hand in water. And then whatever we wash, we whatever we rinse, we dry. Very good. Um, we want to make sure the hand is on a towel, not just on the table. We want a soft surface for that hand. And we're going to clean under the nails. Which edge of the um, orange stick should we use? The slanted or pointed end? Slanted end. Very good. And when we clean under the nails, do we want to take that dirt and put it under another nail? So what do we have to do? Wipe it off. Okay. And then we're going to file. When we file nails, how do we file? One direction toward the center. Very good. And then we'll apply lotion last. But how do we put lotion on? What do we have to do first? Warm it up. And what do we have to do after? Wipe it off. You guys remember all that? Good job. All right. We also learned how to make an occupied bed. You see how far we've gone? All right. We've learned a lot. So making an occupied bed, we're going to make the bottom sheet a half at a time. And in order to do that, we have a saying we use. Clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. Okay. Christine says, if the care plan says to wash both hands, do we use new towels for the other hand? Good question, Christine. First, for the test, you will not be asked to wash two hands. <laughs> it is one. Because where do those evaluators want to be? Home in their pool, drinking their Mai Tais, not watching you wash somebody's hand, right? They figure if they watch you soak one hand, wash one hand, rinse one hand, dry one hand, clean the nails, file them, and lotion, they know you know how to do it. We don't have to see the other side. Good? Good. But to answer your question, in a clinical setting, if you're washing both hands, you don't have to have an extra set of anything. You can use what you have because think about you washing your own hands, right? You, When you wash your own hands, you're using the same water. You're using the same soap. They're touching each other. You're using, you know, the same paper towels to dry them. It's perfectly okay. And you can actually do them at the same time. There's no problem with that. Soak them, take them out to wash them, put them in to rinse, take them out to dry. So you can do them together if you'd like. All right, so clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away with making an occupied bed. Where do we need to be if, the, if we're going to turn the patient on their side? Which side of the bed do we need to be on? Are we turning them toward us or away from us? Away. Away. We're going to remain behind the patients. Yeah, behind. Absolutely. Absolutely. When we're making an occupied bed, it's super important to remove as many wrinkles from the bottom sheet as possible. You're not going to be able to get it 100%. There's a body in the bed, right? It's not going to be 100%. But we don't want a rat's nest of wrinkles in there because wrinkles contribute to bed sores. And we're actually going to get into that lecture today, I think. Um, and then we're going to loosen the sheet over the toes so that it doesn't push those toes down, which is uncomfortable. When we replace the pillowcase, which direction does it need to, to face? Away from the door. Any questions on that? Okay. And we learned range of motion. We actually learned two range of motions. We learned range of motion of the shoulder and range of motion of the hip, elbow and wrist. Was it elbow and wrist? Okay. All right, but it all is it all works the same way. We're going to lift extremities from 
below with a flat palm. We need two points of support, so always at the joints. We're going to move quick or slow? Slowly and smoothly. Always return back to start. Remember, this is not a range of motion. We have to go all the way back to start, okay? And we have three exercises that we can do as CNAs. One of them is flexion extension. What kind of a motion is that? Up and down. We have abduction, adduction. What kind of motion is that? Side to side. And we have rotation. What kind of motion is that? Around, correct. Yep, in one direction. Good? Questions? We've covered a lot of ground. You've learned a lot. And you're, after today, halfway over. I am Carl. It says, hello, good evening. Great learning skills watching from Dubai. Oh, welcome, welcome. We love to have international um, uh, attendees. So welcome. I hear it's a beautiful country I'd love to visit. All right. Rokio says, good morning from Phoenix. I've been watching your classes for a while and thinking about getting my CNA certified. Oh, well, we encourage you to do so. Um, and welcome. Thank you for joining us, making us part of your day. All right. So look how much you've learned. Now we can move on to some new skills. Anybody catch my uh, game show yesterday? Anybody catch the game show? No? Okay. Yesterday, we had 15 questions on um, working with dementia patients, with confused patients. So if you did not attend, you probably want to go back and watch the replay because the questions are very similar to the types of questions you would see on the state exam. I'm actually working on a master test bank right now, every question I've ever written. And there are literally thousands of questions that I have written in my career. You've got some of them in here, right? This book, actually, if you count all the lesson questions, this book has over a thousand questions in it. But I'm actually going to be publishing a master question book on Amazon later this year. So you can take practice tests. If you have a practice test in your book, we'll talk about that at the end of the program. You do have a practice test here. I have some on my website. You have some inside the course as well. But we're going to be publishing a book of practice questions. But if you didn't watch it, you probably need to. All right. So let's go to page 138. And we are going to learn how to turn a patient onto their side with no stress on you or them. And how to use some pillows to position them there so that they stay in that position. So if you look at this page, you can see all of the principles that are involved here. We know skill rules. We follow the care plan, the whole care plan and nothing but the care plan. We're gonna do our opening. Every skill starts with the opening. What does every opening start with? A knock. We're gonna evaluate if we need gloves. We might, uh, but maybe not. We'll see. Oh, 138, sorry. Um, we have to have supplies for this, so we need a place to put them. How do we create a clean space? Barrier. We're going to, this patient's going to be uncovered, so they're going to need a privacy blanket. We're dealing with linen, so we don't want to hold them against our uniform. Scoot and roll, we learned. We're going to scoot a patient toward us and roll them away, so they're always in the middle of the bed. And we're going to do the closing. So we already know these principles. Nothing much there to learn. We're going to use these principles to create this skill. But we do need to learn our skill-specific steps. I thought we went over suit and roll. Okay. Well, you won't have side rails in all settings. Oh, that's why I've got this. Okay. You won't have side rails in all settings. Remember, side rails are a 
restraint. You guys remember learning about that on Monday? Side rails are a restraint. We have to have what kind of an order to use them? A doctor's order. That's right. We can't decide to use them on our own. So um, when we turn a patient, we're going to always have them scoot toward us or we're going to move them toward us before we turn them. So after the turn, where do they end up? in the middle of the bed. And that's the safest place for the patient. Don't rely on a side rail to keep them safe. They need to be in the middle of the bed to keep them safe. Okay. Um, remember, we re remain behind the patient's behind and the patient must always be in the middle of the bed. So if you go to page 139, we're going to look at the care plan for this skill. So up at the top of page 139, you see the care plan displayed there. This is the care plan from the state exam. So it says, position the resident on his left side. So what side are we putting him on? Left his left, not ours. Be careful there. And if you put him on the wrong side, you didn't follow the... So that's going to count big on the state exam. Okay, so you got to get that right. Patient requires support to remain on their side and is unable to assist with turning. This care plan does not tell us they're immobile. <laughs> It just says they're unable to assist with turning. Don't get those two confused in your brain. This is not a comatose patient. This is just one who can't turn over on their side by themselves. Maybe they have a huge incision going down the middle of their tummy area and they can't flip. They need some help. Okay. Be careful not to read more into the care plan than is already there. So remember, this is the slide I was trying to find on Monday. <laughs> remember. We talked about this on Monday. When we have a baby, we put the baby in a crib to keep them confined. But that only works until the baby gets big enough to climb out. And once they're big enough to climb out, is that crib going to keep them in place? No, they're going to climb right over the side rails and fall to the floor. And now they're much more likely to be injured. This is the same thing as this, side rails. Keep an adult confined. Cribs keep a child confined. Children climb over crib rails. Adults climb over side rails. These are dangerous. You cannot rely on them for safety. They can be used additionally if we have a doctor's order, but we can't rely on them by themselves for safety. Remember, there's a difference between positioning rails and side rails. We talked about that. The top rail is a positioning rail. This is perfectly okay. The patient can use it to move around, but it doesn't affect their ability to get out of bed. The minute we put this rail up though, we've restricted their ability and that becomes a restraint. So top rails are fine, bottom rails are not. But let's talk a little bit about immobile patients. I told you this patient is not immobile. Don't read into it. But let's talk a little bit about immobile patients and what that means. When you have somebody who cannot move on their own, who's truly immobile, they can't move about on their own, there's a special set of risks for those patients. And it's going to affect every part of their body. Patients that can't move on their own are going to have skin issues. They're going to have digestive issues. They're going to have respiratory issues. They're going to have hormone issues. They're going to have um, uh, muscle issues. They're, every part of their body is going to be affected when they can't get out of bed. This is why we try to get people up and moving as much as possible. This is the very worst thing you can do to a human is make them bed bound. The very worst thing. So we use things like um, electric lifts if the patient can't get up on their own. Um, we have to turn them every so often so they're not in the same position so things start to move around a little bit. And that's what this skill is about. But remember that an immobile patient cannot move on their own and is going to require assistance for everything. If they can't get up, they can't go to the toilet. If they can't get up, they're not dressing themselves. If they can't get up, they're probably not doing their own mouth care. If they can't get up, 
they're probably not feeding themselves, right? They're going to need help with everything because they can't get up. So we don't want immobile patients. We want to encourage mobility as much as possible. Remember I said that if you put somebody in bed, it only takes about three days for things to start not working. It's not very long. Um, a patient that cannot move on their own won't be able to do anything for themselves. That is immobile. But immobility has other effects. It slows your digestion down. It reduces lung volume. It decreases bone density. It causes muscle, at muscle atrophy. And it decreases immune response and affects cognitive function. Nothing good there. Not a single good thing there. But the biggest organ that immobility affects is the skin. And that's why we have to learn to do this skill. Because if somebody is unable to move themselves, we have to move them on a schedule. So we're going to do a little experiment here. I need you guys to play along. I want you to take one of your hands and sit on it. And you're going to leave it there for two minutes. I'm going to tell you when to pull it out. But please play along. Go ahead and sit on one of your hands. It's going to be uncomfortable. Okay, you're going to want to pull it out, but please don't. I need you to keep it there for about two minutes. I'll let you know when. So when we have somebody that is laying down, remember that gravity is always trying to pull you down, right? Gravity is pulling your body weight through the earth. So right now, the bottom of my feet are feeling the effects of my entire body weight because my body is trying to be pulled down through those points. So my feet are going to get tired and I'm probably going to shift and move a little bit. And that's because as gravity pulls you down, those areas, the lowest areas, the areas closest to the earth's core are going to feel the effects of your body weight. So if you look at this guy, laying down. So the part of his body that is closest to the earth's core, the back of the head, the shoulders, the um, lower back region, the buttocks, the back of the thighs, the back of the calves and the heels, all the areas that are touching the bed, right? All of these areas are feeling the effects of gravity, which means we have bed, we have skin, fat, muscle, blood vessels, bone. Okay, so that's how it's building. Everybody good? As your body weight pushes down, it's going to push down on those blood vessels. And it blocks them off. So now we have areas of the skin that aren't getting good blood. What do you think is going to happen to them if they're not getting good blood flow? Yeah, anything without blood eventually is going to die. So that means all of those areas are at risk for that skin to die just because of the weight pressing down. So we have bones that are pressing down onto blood vessels, muscle, fat, and skin, and it's constantly pressing down, squishing down. And when it does that, it squishes these blood vessels, cuts them off. Any wrinkles that are in the bed are going to squish or going to compress that in an upward motion. So now we've got bone pressing down and wrinkles pressing up. So in between, we're not getting good blood flow. And that's very, very dangerous for our patients. So the muscle and the skin is caught in between these two forces. And without good blood flow, those tissues start to separate. So go ahead and take your hand out real quick. This process doesn't take very long. Take a look at your hand. Do you have color changes? Yeah. Does your hand turn red, pink? Yeah. All right. Can, look closely. Can you see the pattern of the chair or your clothes indented into the skin? Can you see that? That only took two minutes. Your body weight pressing down on your hand caused indentations in two minutes. Now, if you had not moved that hand, if you had left it in the exact same position for 24 hours, if two minutes did this, 
If you left it in that same position for 24 hours, those lines are going to get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and cut into your skin. This is how a bed sore happens. When we have wrinkles below and we have weight above, whatever area is caught in between the two is going to tear open the skin and cause a pressure sore. Now, your hands got, got red in two minutes. This doesn't take long to happen. This is why when we have a patient that is immobile and can't move around on their own, we're going to have to move them for them. And this is usually done about every two hours around the clock. But we always go back to the care plan for our instructions. So your care plan may say every two hours around the clock, but it might say every hour around the clock, depending on the needs of the patient, okay? When you sleep at night, when you lay down in bed and you close your eyes and you go to sleep, you do not wake up in the exact same position you went to sleep in. You move around during the night. You toss, you turn, you stretch, you flex. You do all kinds of things. And the whole reason for that is so that we can restore circulation to those areas that are touching the bed. That's why you toss and you turn. Have you ever laid down in bed for a couple hours and your muscles get really sore? That's because they're not getting adequate blood flow. Movement is essential. So patients that can't move on their own must be turned at least every two hours around the clock or as often as directed in the care plan. But the way we do this, we do this a very specific way. When we have a patient that we are going to turn, we're going to start out on their back. After two hours, they'll go to their right side. After two hours, they'll go to their back. Two hours later, right, uh, uh, left side, two hours later, back. So back, right, back, left, back, right, back, left. And you can see that here. Um, we have back, right, back, left, back, right, back, left, back, right, back, left, back, right, back, left. And it just goes on and on. But notice stomach is never on there. Nowhere on there does it say put the patient on their stomach. It's either their back or their right side or their left side. And the reason is if you have an immobile patient, Everything's being pushed down to the center of the earth. That means all of our weight on our back is pressing down. So if we have the bed below and we have our weight above, the lungs in between aren't able to open up and breathe effectively. And you can suffocate a patient by putting them on their stomach if they're unable to uh, inflate their lungs well. So we don't put them on their stomach unless the care plan tells us to. Make sense? Now there's a special consideration here and this is why we have to follow our care plan. During COVID, when COVID first came out and all the people were in the hospital on vents and it was a horrible, horrible, horrible thing and we were hearing daily updates, what they found was that patients with COVID did much better if we put them on their stomach. So. We always follow the care plan, okay? I'm telling you, immobile patients normally don't go on their stomach unless the care plan tells us otherwise. Good? Um, what if they, like, want to be on their stomach for the side, like? If you can't follow the care plan, right? So the care plan says, you know, Back, right, back, left, you know, we're, we're going to put them lateral, which is on their side. Um, and the patient says, hey, I really want to be on my stomach. Who would you give that information to? The nurse. Yep, absolutely. So you would just tell the nurse, hey, the patient's asking to be on their stomach. It's not in the care plan. What do you want me to do? And let them direct you. Because everything's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. 
If you're a stomach sleeper, you probably want to be on your stomach, but it's up to the nurse to decide whether that's in the patient's best interest. Okay, good. So when we turn the patient, they must remain in what part of the bed? Middle. The middle, the safe zone. Absolutely. Never turn a patient so they're close to the edge. Especially when they're on their side because it doesn't take much for them to fall off the bed. So we're going to scoot them toward us so that they're in the middle after the turn and we'll roll them on their side in the middle of the bed. So we learned all of this on Monday. But what if they're immobile and they can't scoot towards you? For the test, they can. Yay. Makes it so much easier. You can ask the patient, scoot toward me, please. And they will for the test. It doesn't tell us they're immobile. Our care plan doesn't tell us they're immobile, just as they can't turn. But what if in a clinical setting they are? What if they're immobile? What do we do? Well, we can move them in segments. So head and shoulders, torso, hips, legs. We might want to use a draw sheet, which is a long sheet folded in half lengthwise under the patient. So the folded edge is under the shoulders and the two halves that come together are under the thighs. And we can use it as a sling to actually pick the patient's body weight up and scoot it toward us. Draw sheets work well. We also have things like slide sheets. These things are amazing. Um, they kind of almost levitate the patient. They're super, super slippery. No water, but they're super slippery. You can put it underneath the patient and move them very easily as well. You're going to use the method indicated in the care plan. Okay. Patient has super fragile skin. We don't want them sliding. We would want to use a draw sheet. But if the patient has lots of compression fractures, we may not want to use the draw sheet. So Every situation is going to need a different approach. How do we know which situ or which um, uh, technique to use in each situation? The care, plan. the care plan. All right. So let me teach you the process to make this work easily. If you've got somebody laying in bed, you can't just come up and just kind of push them over on their side. That takes a lot of force. can end, end up hurting the patient, but it can also injure you as well. You can turn somebody three times your body weight using this technique, three times your body weight, and it not hurt you or them, as long as we set them up properly to begin with. And the way that we do that is you have four extremities. So we're going to look at each one of these four independently. The furthest arm goes above their head like this. The closest arm to you crosses their chest. So if I'm going to turn them on their left side, remember, I always have to remain behind there behind after the turn, right? So I'm going to be on the right side of the bed, scoot them toward me. The furthest arm goes up, the closest arm crosses the chest. If I'm going to turn them on their right side, then I would be on the left side of the bed. Furthest arm goes up, closest arm crosses the chest. Okay, good. Good. Now let's go to the legs. The furthest leg, the knee is going to be built, bent and angled out. So we're going to angle that knee out. The closest leg, the knee will be bent and the foot placed on the bed. Okay. So we have furthest arm above the head, closest arm across the chest, furthest knee angled out, closest knee bent with the foot on the bed. And when you do this, when you get this set up, you can put a hand on a hip and a hand on a shoulder and very gently just roll them to the side. It doesn't take any effort at all as long as you do your prep work first. Because when you get a patient positioned in this position, they're already half on their side by the time you're done. So it doesn't take much work to finish putting them there. But just because we put them on their side doesn't mean they're going to stay there. Remember I said on Monday, gravity is always trying to pull them back onto their back. So we need to use a couple pillows in place to keep them in this position. So we are going to uh, use four pillows for this. One that's already on the bed and three that we're going to get. So we're going to position them for turning. Furthest arm up, closest arm crosses the chest, closest knee bent with foot on the bed and furthest knee angled out. 
We'll roll the patient to the middle of the bed. We want the upper knee in front of the lower knee, not stacked right on top. We're gonna put a pillow behind the back in a roll. We're gonna put a pillow between the legs, specifically between the knees and ankles. You don't want those bones rubbing together. And we're gonna put a pillow under that top arm to get it in a neutral position. The fourth pillow is already on the bed. It's under their head, but when you turn them, it's probably under their shoulder. So their shoulder will do this. That puts a lot of pressure along their back and into their head and can cause headaches and muscle spasms. So you want to uh, kind of move that pillow so it's not under the shoulder, it's just under the head and the neck. Okay. We want to make sure the call light is in the lower hand. We don't want that cord from the call light going across the patient. So the cord has to wrap around the bed and go in that lower hand. That's a choking risk. Good. So let's look at the care plan one more time. Position the resident on his left side. Patient requires support to remain on his side and is unable to assist with turning. Okay. So let me show you this video because it has good close-ups and it's important for you to be able to see how those position, how those pillows are positioned. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good, how are you? Oh, wonderful. I need to turn you onto your left side. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain for privacy. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay. I'll start gathering your supplies. We'll start with a barrier, which I'll place on the table to provide a clean area to place my supplies. And I'll get three pillows from clean supply cabinet, being careful not to allow them to touch my uniform. Mr. Jones, I'm gonna place this blanket over you, and this will help keep you warm and protect your privacy while we do this seal. Once I have the blanket in place, then I'll pull the sheet down underneath the blanket, making sure the patient remains covered at all times. Okay, Mr. Jones, if I could have you scoot toward me, please. Okay. I'm gonna place your furthest arm above your head and cross your closest arm over your chest. I'm going to bend the closest knee and put the foot flat on the bed. And I'm going to angle the furthest knee out a little bit. Okay, now I'm going to turn you onto your side. One, two, three. See how easy they roll when you get them prepped properly? Okay, I'm going to take the first pillow and put it in an angle up against the back and I'm going to tuck this top edge underneath the patient by pushing down on the pillow and under his back. This edge will roll up and then it too will be pushed down and under forming a roll along the back. Okay now I'm going to position a pillow between the two legs by lifting the top leg and laying the pillow lengthwise between the two legs, specifically between the knees and the ankles, to prevent those bony areas from rubbing together. This pillow is going to be placed underneath the upper arm. 
This will help keep the arm in a neutral position as the patient remains on their side. And then I'm going to adjust the pillow underneath the head to make sure that it's not under the shoulder and it remains only under the head and the neck. And then move the arm to a more comfortable position. Is that comfortable, Mr. Jones? Yes. Okay, I'm going to place the call light directly in your hand. Are you comfortable? Yes. Can I get you anything else while I'm here? No. Okay, let me pull your sheet up. And remove the privacy blanket. Being careful not to dislodge all of those pillows as I do so. I'll roll the privacy blanket up and place it in dirty linen. The barrier will be thrown away. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to open your privacy curtain now. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, I'll see you soon. Let me go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review all the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right, any questions on that? Any questions? It's a bit of a longer skill. Takes a little while to do. But once you learn those pillow positions, it's not very hard. I'm going to tell you, though, that the back pillow, I make that look very easy. It's not. You're going to have to practice this and work at it because if you don't get that pillow tucked tightly underneath the patient, it's going to pop out on you. And during the test, if that pillow doesn't stay in a roll, it will count against you. So you can kind of um, pull the patient back onto the pillow a little bit to help hold it in position, but you want to make sure that it stays in a roll to keep them on their side. So that one's going to require a little bit of practice for you. Okay. Let's go on to page 118 and we're going to talk about foot care. So along the side here, you can see all the principles that are involved in foot care. We're going to follow the care plan. We're going to do our opening. Every skill starts with an opening. Every opening starts with a knock. We have to evaluate if we need gloves. So let me stop here for a second. If you look at the bottom here, you'll see that this is going to be done on a live testing student. That means one of you may be a patient for this skill. Okay, one of you may be a patient for this skill. Because foot care, the whole purpose of foot care, we're about to find this out in just a minute, but the whole purpose of foot care is to look at the bottom of the foot for anything that the patient may not know is there. Any red areas, sores, wounds, rashes, athlete's foot, toenails that need to be trimmed, anything that we see, right? Our whole purpose here is observation. Because we don't know if those things exist, we do need to wear gloves for this skill. Okay? Because there's a maybe there. Um, we're going to use a barrier, but this time we're going to put the barrier on the floor because people can't put their feet way up here. <laughs> we have to do this skill on the floor, so the barrier goes on the floor. Linen rules apply. Washing rules apply. Basin cleaning rules apply. And we'll end with the closing. So you know all of the steps for this. You just don't know that you know it yet. And that's what I'm going to show you. But we need to learn our specific steps of foot care. So no new principles to learn here. We know everything we need to know to get this job done. So let's read the care plan. This is at the top of page 119. And our care plan tells us to provide foot care to one foot using soap and water. One foot. How many feet are we washing? One. What if the patient has two? Um, washing. No washing one. And for the test, you get to pick which one. In a clinical setting, if you're only washing one, they're going to tell you which one. Okay. 
The resident is sitting in a chair. Their sock and shoes should be replaced at the end of the skill. Let me explain to you why it says that. Remember that you may be a patient for this skill. In a clinical setting, if we do foot care, we're putting on new socks. Clean feet, clean socks. Good? But you may be a patient for this during the test, and you don't have an extra set of socks in your back pocket, right? You're not taking those to the testing center. All you've got is what you came with. Well, because normally, if we clean the feet, we need clean socks, our care plan is telling us how to handle this. Replace the patient's sock and shoe at the end. It's telling us what to do there. We're not going to get clean. Just put the ones back on that they came with. Good? Clinical setting won't say that. That's for the test. Step-by-step -step instructions there. You've got a couple practice questions here that you can answer. And at the bottom, it shows you all of the supplies that you need for this particular skill. So this is a whole lot like hand and nail care. Very, very similar. With hand and nail care, we supported the wrist and arm at all times. With foot care, we're going to support the foot at all times. With hand and nail care, we soak the hand in water. With foot care, we're going to soak the foot in water. Um, whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. With hand and nail care, we're going to do the same with foot care. Good morning. And this is where things change. Okay, so all of those steps were the same. This is where things change. Uh, on the care plan, if they ask you to wash one foot and the patient requests his other foot to be washed, for OCD or whatever reason, would you wash the other foot as well or would you take that up to the nurse? So we have to follow the, the and if the care plan tells us one foot, we can't change that. So who's the only one that can override that? The nurse. So our answer is we have to take it to the nurse. There's a reason that they don't want that other foot washed. I don't know what it is. I have no idea what that reason is. Maybe they just put some medicated ointment on it and they don't want you to wash it off. It's a possibility. Maybe there's a wound on there that they don't want submerged in water. That's a possibility. Maybe the nurse is going to do foot care on the other foot because they're trying to evaluate the treatment that we've implemented. That's a possibility. So we don't know why they don't want the other foot done, but we can't change the care plan until they tell us to. Okay, good. All right, so we're gonna support the foot, we're gonna soak, we're gonna wash, rinse and dry, and that's where the similarities kind of end, okay? Because with hand and nail care, we cleaned under the nails and we filed the rough edges, but with foot care, we are not doing anything with nails. We don't clean under the nails, we don't file the nails. We don't trim the nails. We don't grind the nails. We don't do anything with toenails other than look at them. This is really important because feet are usually hidden. They're in socks and shoes. They're under the sheet in the bed. You don't get to see people's feet very often. They're usually covered or hidden. So if the patient has a toenail issue, it may go unrecognized. People may not know that there's a toenail issue because the feet are covered. That is what foot care is all about, is to have an opportunity to inspect the feet. It really has nothing to do with cleaning. Cleaning is why we're there. Now, the reason for that is years and years and years ago, this is a new skill, by the way, over the last 15, 10 years, probably, years ago, we would just tell CNAs, make sure you look at every patient's feet every shift. If you see anything, let me know. Pretty simple, right? Just make sure you look at their feet. Well, the CNAs would go over to the patient. I don't know why that nurse wants me to look at your feet. I got enough to do. They lift the sheet and put it down. Yeah, you got feet. What do you want? What do you want from me? Right? That didn't help. Now we've got issues that aren't getting observed. So we created a skill. We figured if you soak the foot and wash the foot and rinse the foot 
and dry the foot and lotion the foot somewhere in there, you'll actually look at the foot. That is the whole reason you were doing this skill is to inspect all surfaces. This is why we're doing this skill. Not to clean the foot, but to look at it. Does that make sense? Good. And one of the things that we're looking at are toenails because in long-term care facilities, we have a podiatrist or foot doctor that comes around to the facility every month and they see patients that have foot issues that need to be addressed. But the only way that that podiatrist knows that there's an issue is if you do foot care, identify a problem, tell the nurse, the nurse puts them on the list, and then when the podiatrist comes in, they see the people on the list. So that whole scenario starts with you observing the foot and then reporting anything you see. So we're not doing anything with toenails except looking at them. If they're long, the nurse needs to know. If they're super thick, the nurse needs to know. If there's red areas, the nurse needs to know. If there's wounds, the nurse needs to know. The whole reason you're there is to look at the foot. Good? Make sense? Okay. At the end of the skill, we'll put some lotion on. So we're going to soak the foot, wash the foot, rinse the foot, dry the foot, put some lotion on it. But the whole reason we're there is to observe, look at the foot. But when we put lotion on, we don't want to put lotion between the toes. Between the toes is already warm, dark, moist, because we sweat there. When you put lotion on there, it actually holds the moisture in place, and it can lead to athlete's foot. So no lotion between the toes. Lotion on the top of the foot, lotion on the bottom of the foot, but no lotion between the toes. Good? Questions? Don't put their bare feet on the floor. Make sure their bare feet are on the barrier, not directly on the floor. And when we put the sock on, we want to remove the wrinkles, just like we did with dressing. Toe seam over the toes, no wrinkles. You want it applied appropriately. And then we'll put the shoe and sock on. Okay. But let's talk about why we're actually doing this. In order to understand foot care, you have to learn a little bit about diabetes. So we're going to spend about the next 20 minutes talking about diabetes, and then I'll show you the skill and you'll have a break. You will have about a half hour or so of practice time at the end of class today. So we've got quite a few skills under our belt now. We've got something to practice. So starting today, you'll have practice time built into the program. I will turn the camera off. We stop broadcasting during practice time so that you can practice freely. And I encourage you to stay and practice. You have everything you need. You've got the supplies, the mannequin, the beds, everything you need to practice, but I can't keep you here. During practice time, you are free to leave if you choose to. But if you're not practicing here, you better make sure you're practicing somewhere because you're not gonna master these skills just simply by watching me do them. You have to do them yourself. So if you're not gonna practice here, make sure you practice somewhere. So that's the game plan for today. I'm gonna to spend 20 minutes talking about diabetes. We're gonna look at the video for this, and then we're gonna take a break. We have two more skills to learn after that, and then you'll have some practice time. So let's talk about diabetes. This is very important because approximately half of your patients are going to have diabetes. And I need you to understand what it is and what we're going to do about it and what risks the patient now has because of diabetes. So we're going to go through this. This is a fifth grade version. I am really simplifying this and watering it down. There are nurses that spend their entire careers studying diabetes. It's extremely complex, but I'm going to really simplify this and do a surface level overview. Okay. All right, so every cell in your body, every cell in your body needs fuel, has to be fed to work properly. And the fuel that most cells use form, comes in the form of glucose. 
or sugar. Sugar is what fuels your cells. So the way that we get sugar is that our cells get hungry. Our brain decides we're going to eat. When we eat carbs, what's an example of a carb? Anybody know? Bread? Yep. Pasta, rice, potatoes, flour, sugar, anything made with flour, anything made with sugar. Okay, those are all examples of carbs. So here we've got some carbs. So we eat carbs and the body breaks those down into sugar. Those sugar molecules have to get into the cell to be effective, but the cells have doors that are locked. So we need a key to open the door. So when you eat carbs and it breaks it down into sugar, the brain tells the pancreas, hey, we need some keys. So the pancreas produces a key that opens the door and lets the sugar in. And now the cell is happy. You guys understand that? Okay. So in our body, we have a pancreas and its job is to produce keys to open your cell doors. Those keys have a name, it's called insulin. So when you eat carbs, your pancreas has to produce insulin to allow that sugar into the cells to be effective. That's where diabetes has a, a, an effect, okay? So we have a cell that's starving, we eat carbs, it breaks down into sugar, the body produces insulin, insulin opens the cell, and the sugar enters in a normally functioning system. But in um, diabetes, we have a starving cell, we eat carbs, they break down into sugar, that system doesn't change. The problem is that we don't have any keys. Our pancreas isn't making keys. So the sugar is just building up but it isn't able to enter that cell. So it's not doing what it needs to do. Those cells are starving. And cells can get pretty loud when they're starving. We call these cravings. We'll get there in a second. Let me explain to you what happens with all of that excess sugar that can't get into the cells. The problem is, Where are you? Oh, there it is. Okay, the problem is that um, your body doesn't get rid of sugar easily. So if you eat carbs, they break down into sugar. We don't have any insulin, so that sugar just builds up in your system. It isn't able to be um, used by the cells. It can't get into the cells to be used as fuel. That sugar just builds up. You can't get rid, you don't pee it out. You can't get rid of it. So what the body does is it says, oh, we must not need this sugar. It's extra sugar. So we can't pee it out. So we're going to store it. So it packs it up in a packing box called glycogen and it shoves it into a storage unit called our fat cells. So when you eat carbs and they break down into sugar, if your body isn't able to utilize that sugar, we pack it away and store it for later. Okay, good. All right, that's important because if you ever have a time in your life that you need excess sugar and you don't have ready access to it, we can open those storage units, pull that glycogen out, unpack it and use it. But glycogen kind of has a use by date on it. If you don't use it, then it kind of goes icky and you can't use it. So this is why when we have a lot of excess sugar that we've taken in, and we've put it into our fat cells and we don't use it, the fat cells just kind of hang around and we carry excess weight that's very hard to get rid of because your body isn't able to use the glycogen anymore. Does that kind of make sense a little bit? 
Okay, so what I need you to understand is when we take in carbs, if it's not used by the cells, it circulates. Once the um, our storage units are full, it just circulates and circulates and circulates and circulates. Now, this is a crystal. Glucose is a crystal. If you look at these crystals, do you see how sharp and jagged those edges are? These are crystals, just like glucose. Think of rock candy, okay? Crystals. Now, these crystals because they have sharp, jagged edges, they're circulating in your system. But gravity goes to work here. Remember, gravity is trying to pull everything down. So these crystals are heavy. That means they're going to be pulled down to the lowest points of my body. So lowest points of my upper body are my hands. Lowest points of my lower body are my feet. So these crystals are going to be pulled to those areas the most, okay? So hands and feet are going to get the most effect here with these heavy crystals. Now, these crystals, they get tired of circulating. They're heavy. So they tend to coat the inside of our arteries. Now, when we're born, our arteries look like this. This is a very nice artery. I wish mine looked like this. There's lots of room for good, healthy blood flow. This is a nice looking artery, but they don't stay like this. And the reason they don't stay like this is because of our American diet. Now, a lot of people that are older, they'll go, I don't understand why I have diabetes. I didn't have it before. Why do I have it now? Let me explain to you why. Diabetes does not start when you're in your 60s. It starts when you're two years old. You just don't know it. And the reason is, let's say that we have a two-year-old who gets up at 5.30 in the morning. Mom's not all about that. So mom gets up with baby, with two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old, gives him a Pop-Tart, puts him in front of the TV, and then kind of naps a little bit on the couch until a more civilized hour. Kid eats the Pop-Tart. Mom gets up 7, 7.30 and gives the child a bowl of cereal. Now, children aren't eating all bran, are they? What are children eating for cereal? Fruit Loops, Fruity Pebbles, Captain Crunch, right? All the good stuff. Yeah. So that Pop-Tart that the child ate at 5.30 in the morning, that, those were carbs. Those carbs broke down into sugar. That sugar made the pancreas produce insulin. Insulin opened the cell. The sugar went in. Cells were happy. The cereal is all carbs, which breaks down into sugar, which made the pancreas produce insulin. Insulin unlocked the cells, the sugar went in, cells are happy. Now it's mid-morning snack time. So mom's good mom, she gives the child fruit. Fruit is still sugar. Breaks down into fructose, which is still sugar. That makes the pancreas produce insulin to open the cells so the uh, fructose can go in and feed the cells. Now it's lunchtime, national toddler diet of chicken nuggets and mac and cheese, which are carbs with a little bit of protein, but still carbs predominantly. So the carbs get broken down into sugar. The pancreas has to produce insulin. Insulin unlocks the cells. The sugar goes in. Afternoon snack, probably a little Debbie's or a little thing of chips, which are all carbs breaking down into sugar, insulin is produced by the pancreas, sugar enters the cell. Dinner time, buttered spaghetti. Spaghetti is carbs. Carbs break down into sugar, makes the pancreas produce insulin. And then, of course, we have to have dessert before bed, which is carbs. Do you guys see how much work this pancreas had to do? One day. Now, you do that day after day after day after day after day for 60 years, and your pancreas at some point is going to go, dude, I'm done. I have worked my little tail end off here. I am done, and it just quits producing insulin. And that is how adult onset diabetes happens. It doesn't happen at 60. It started at 2 because of the American diet. 
So you need to know this because a lot of your patients are going to have diabetes. So we start out with arteries like this. Like these, these are good arteries. But after a couple of years of all of this sugar going round and round and round and not having anywhere to go, we run into some problems because that sugar is going to start to coat the inside of these arteries. And remember, our sugar is crystals. So as these crystals start to coat the inside of the arteries, they become more rigid. They can't expand. They can't contract which means if we need more blood to an area, tough luck. We're stuck. We can't expand. If you're bleeding and we need to close off that area so that we don't lose much blood, tough luck because your arteries can't contract. Now, the crystals do even more than that, though, because they're sharp and jagged. Anything that's floating by can get caught up in those crystals, shredded like cells, platelets red blood cells that carry oxygen, white blood cells that fight infection, your cells can get shredded. And it's going to catch cholesterol as it floats by. <coughs> cholesterol in your uh, arteries looks like pizza cheese. So as you go through this American diet, you end up with an artery that starts to get a little buildup. So this is sugar molecules, these are cholesterol um, fragments and cells that have been shredded. Notice that this is not as wide open as this. It's just a little bit different, not much. But this person might have a little bit higher blood pressure, just a little. If we don't change our ways, though, we end up with an artery that looks like this. This is middle-aged. This is a lot of sugar crystals that have captured a lot of other things floating by. And if you look in there, it doesn't have as much space for good blood. So if I get injured, I'm not going to get as much healthy healing blood where it needs to go because there's stuff in the way. Now, once we get into full-blown diabetes, our arteries look like this. This is why diabetics don't heal very well. There's no room in there for good, healthy blood to get where it needs to go. It's also why they have higher blood pressure. There's not much room in there for blood, period. And anytime blood slows down or stops, it clots. So now we're at risk for blood clots. Does that sound good at all? So our diabetic patients have a lot of strikes against them. But even worse, that sugar doesn't limit itself to just the arteries. That sugar is also going to coat nerves as well. And we are hardwired creatures. There's nothing wireless about us. If I stub my toe, there is a physical wire connecting my toe to my brain. It's called a nerve. And if that nerve is coated with sugar that has nowhere else to go, that signal may not make it to my brain. So my toe knows that I stubbed it, but my brain has no idea. This is how injuries to feet can go unrecognized. And if you remember, I said two places on the body that this is going to happen the most predominantly is hands and feet because of gravity pulling those crystals down. This is why we do hand and nail care and foot care. We're looking for a problem. Let me give you a story to explain this. This is a real story, really happened. I was a agency nurse. Agency nurses or substitute nurses, you know, in high school, when your teacher couldn't show up, they, there was a sub, right? Well, that's what agency nurses are. They're substitute nurses. I don't work for the facility. They call me in when they don't have any regular nurses to show up. So I go into this facility and I'm assigned to the rehab unit. Short term, usually less than three months. Patients are supposed to get better and go home, wherever home is. And I go in to see a patient. He was in a room. Um, in bed, there was a small light above his bed, you know, one of those little fluorescent light things, but the rest of the room lights were off. 
Well, as a nurse, my job is to do a head to toe assessment, real problems, potential problems. So I walk in, I turn the light on, got a cup of pills, cup of pills with me, turn the light on and he starts yelling right away, turn it off, turn it off. So I flip the light off and walk to the bed and now I got to figure out why he doesn't want the light. So I'm asking him, hey, Henry, I'm Patty, your nurse today. What's up with the light? He says, oh, I've got diabetic retinopathy. The bright lights really hurt my eyes. I don't like bright lights. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to be your nurse today. I'm here to, you know, give you your pills. Let me do a quick assessment. But as I'm standing there, I catch an odor. Now, if you've ever smelled a wound, they're very distinctive. You can kind of pick it up at 50 paces. So as we're talking, I pull out my report sheet from my pocket and we're talking and I'm just kind of glancing at my report sheet. There's nothing on there about a wound. There's no wound care orders. There, there's nothing. And I'm, my head's going, this guy's got to have a wound because I'm smelling it. So I ask him, hey, Henry, can I take a, a quick peek? I think you might have a wound brewing somewhere and I need to take a look. He's a gruff guy in his 50s. Definitely a little rough around the edges. He says, do what you got to do. So he turned over and I looked at all the usual suspects, the backs, back of the head, the tips of the ears, the shoulder blades, the lower back or coccyx area, the buttocks, the back of the thighs, back of the calves. I'm not seeing a whole lot there. I get to his feet and he's got those slipper socks on. You know the ones I'm talking about that have the dots on them, right? So he's got these slipper socks on and I... Tell him, hey, Henry, I don't see a wound anywhere. Can I take your socks off and look at your feet? And he immediately barks, no. Okay. So there's my red flag. Because if he's telling me no, what did he tell the CNAs? No. So we have no idea how long this guy had gone with nobody looking at his foot. No idea. But now I've got to turn up the charm because you can always get further with patients by being nice than being mean. So, and it's hard to uh, resist me when I become very charming. So I turn up the charm and I get him to agree to allow me to look at his feet. Took the left sock off. It came off just fine. Foot was a little scaly. Need, definitely needed some foot care and lotion, but overall in not bad shape. The right sock was stuck to the bottom of his foot. Couldn't get it off. Found it, found my problem. So I go get a basin of warm salt water. We call it warm saline. And I put the whole foot in it, sock and all, the whole thing, because I got to loosen it up so I can see what I'm working with. I come back about 10 minutes later. I peel the sock away. And as I did, as I was pulling the sock away, it was kind of stuck to the bottom of his foot. And I had to use a little bit of force to get it to break free. Now, when I did, something went flying past my head. I could feel it go flying past my head. So now I look and the floor was just like this, little speckled floor. Baseboards were just like this, the tall clinical rubber baseboards. And up next to the baseboard, took me a minute to find it because it kind of blended in, was one of these. This is a flat white metal painted thumbtack that came out of his foot. This is not the thumbtack. <laughs> this is another one, but it came out of his foot. So the first question you have is, wait a minute. If he had a thumbtack in his foot, wouldn't he have known it? Well, not necessarily because I told you he had diabetic retinopathy, which means he has diabetes. And that sugar coated the nerves in his feet. So his foot knew this was there, but his brain did not. So now I'm looking at this foot because I got the sock off and he had an area about this big around. It wasn't quite that um, symmetrical, but about this big around. And it was dead, hard, black tissue. Now we're good in medicine. We can heal a lot of things, but dead is dead. We, we can't really do much with dead. We're not at the Frankenstein era yet where we can bring dead back to life. Okay. So dead is dead. So I know this guy's got a very bad road in front of him. 
There's no way around it. So I called the doctor. I called the family. I got my wound care orders. I called the wound care specialist. I documented everything, took my pictures, and then left at the end of the shift. Not my patient. Not my facility. About nine or 10 months later, I get assigned back to that facility, but this time I'm on the long-term care side. And as I'm going through my patient list, I see his name, Henry. Now this is sad because Henry went from the short-term side to the, and this is now where he lives. Remember I said he was in his fifties. That's way young to be living in a facility. So I go in and, hey, Henry, I'm Patty. I'm the nurse that found the wound on your foot many months ago. How are you doing? So nice to see you again. And he pulls the sheet back and he had had to have a below the knee amputation. He lost his leg. He lost his leg. Now, this is tragic for me for several reasons. It was completely preventable, completely preventable. First of all, if the CNA had done foot care, we could have found that wound before it became a problem. And if the CNA couldn't do foot care, who should they have told? The nurse. the nurse. We don't know how long this guy had gone with no foot care. So number one, preventable, staff should have done their job. Number two, preventable, is if when this guy was out of bed, somebody put shoes on his feet, where would the thumbtack be? In the shoe. We don't amputate shoes. When you have a patient that is out of bed, we have to have shoes on their feet. <coughs> Slipper socks are not enough. Slipper socks do not protect you against injury. Do you guys understand that? Slipper socks are not enough. So now we're going to get into shoe rules. And we're going to go over this a little bit more in an upcoming lesson next week. But I need you to remember, slipper socks are not enough. When a patient is up moving around, we need something on their feet that's much more protective than just slipper socks. Okay, So if the feet are going to hit the floor, we have to talk about their shoes. So this skill requires that we put the shoe on. And the evaluators need to see that action. You need to put shoe on foot. You're not just going to say, yeah, your shoe is there if you need it. You need to put the shoe on because this is an important part of shoe rules. Okay, Slipper socks are not enough. Now, the other thing about slipper socks that you probably don't think about, how many guys have ever been a patient in a hospital? Anybody? Anybody patient? Okay. When you were a patient at the hospital, they probably gave you a hospital gown and those little slipper socks, didn't they? And you probably got out of bed and walked to the bathroom in those slipper socks. You did what you needed to do, and then you walked back to the bed, and then you got in bed with those slipper socks on. Do you know what climbed into bed with you? Everything. Everything. Now, if you happen to have an incision... Incisions are warm, dark, moist places. So where do you think those pathogens huddled up to? That wound. that wound, that is correct. And this is how surgical site incisions can happen. Don't walk in just slipper socks. Not in a clinical setting. All right, so when we're doing foot care, we're gonna soak the foot in the basin just like hand care. We're going to take it out of the basin to wash it, just like hand care. We're going to support it and put it on a towel. We're going to wash, rinse, and dry all areas, just like hand care. We're not going to put lotion between the toes, but the whole reason we're there is to inspect. We're looking for anything, anything to report, anything. Don't put their bare feet on the floor. We'll put the sock back on, removing the wrinkles, and then we're going to put that shoe back on. Good? Okay, so page 119 has your step-by-step -step instructions. The bottom of the page shows your supplies that you need for that skill. We've got a couple of practice questions here so you can make sure that you understand the important parts. And our care plan says provide foot care to one foot using soap and, and water. 
The resident is sitting in her chair. Their sock and shoe should be replaced at the end of the stay. All right, so let me show you this video and then we'll take a break. I have to show this one in video because I can't get on the floor anymore. Actually, I can't get off the floor anymore. <laughs> I got to retake these videos next month and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do this one because I can't get down there and back up. We'll see how it works out. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Wonderful. I need to do foot care. Is that okay? Yes. Let me go close your curtain, wash my hands, and then I'll gather your supplies. Okay. Okay, I'm going to get a barrier and we'll place this on the floor right in front of you and you can place your foot on the barrier. I'm going to get a basin, soap, and lotion. We'll place that on the barrier. I'm going to get two washcloths and a towel and a set of gloves. I'm going to get some water for washing. Okay, Mr. Jones, would you like to check the water temperature and make sure it's okay? Yes. Is great. it good? Yes, great. Okay. Very good. I'm going to set this here. And I'm going to kneel on the barrier and apply my gloves. I'm going to roll up your pants leg and lift your foot so I can remove your sock. We'll place your foot in the basin to soak. I'll take the first washcloth and wring it out, making sure that your foot is wet. I'm going to place your foot over here on the towel and apply soap to the washcloth. You want to wash all surfaces of the foot. I'm going to lift your foot up so I can wash the bottom and I'll observe for any red areas, wounds, sores, or any other abnormalities. We'll put your foot back in the basin to rinse. Okay, I'm going to place your foot on the towel to dry. I'll ensure all surfaces have been dried thoroughly. I'll take one of the narrow edges and go between your toes to blot. And I'll dry the bottom of your foot. Now I'm going to apply some lotion. We'll warm the lotion in our hands. Apply lotion to all surfaces except between the toes. So I'm going to lift your foot and we'll apply lotion to the bottom as well as the top. And now I'm going to wipe off the excess lotion so that you don't slip. Okay, go ahead and place your foot back on the barrier. And now I can reapply your soap. Put your shoe back on. Can you slide your foot 
in there for me, please? Okay, Mr. Jones, I need to put all of my supplies away now. I'm going to gather my dirty linen and place it in the dirty linen hamper. I'm going to take the basin to the sink and clean according to the basin cleaning procedure. On the way back, I'll collect the soap and the lotion and put the basin back in the drawer. Now I'll collect the barrier and throw it away. Now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, your call light is here. If you should need anything at all, please let me know. Can I get you a magazine while you're waiting? No, thank you. I'm going to open my curtain and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. Okay, any questions on foot care? Any questions on foot care? No? All right, let's go ahead and take a break. Come back in 15 minutes, so uh, 10 after. 10 after will work.
Lord, I can't win. I can't win. Today is not my day.
today is I'm telling you, today's <laughs> not my day. We all we get those things. Like those days that I'll just run into everything. Mm hmm Better than dropping a whole plate of um of dishes. Oh my gosh. What was even worse is on my first my um the first day at my job. I broke they have like a tablecloth and they put a piece of glass over to look, make it look nice. I worked in the ALA. And I dropped a metal Knife, not butter knife, mm -hmm. and it broke the box. And I was like, "Well, oh, shit." <laughs> when did you did you tell him or did you leave it? Oh, I told him. And then the other girl, the lady that had been, she's been there for like thirty years, mm -hmm. was like, "They take two hundred dollars on your paycheck." I'm like, "I can't afford that." I would. She goes. I'm just joking. Oh, <laughs> I was about to say, I was just, just said, Oh, yeah, one of the residents broke it. It wasn't me, I promise.
Okay. Sorry, I got distracted by a phone call. Somebody had questions. Okay. So we're going to move on to page 92. And this is mouth care. There's not much to teach you here, guys. You all know how to brush teeth. Not much to teach you with this one. If you look at the principles here, we know skill rules. We're going to follow the, we're going to do the opening. We're going to evaluate if we need gloves. Spoiler alert, you do because you're working with saliva. We need a barrier to put our clean supplies on. Linen rules apply. Don't hold stuff against your uniform. We're going to clean the basin the way we clean everything else. And we're going to do the closing. So not a whole lot to teach you here. You already know the principles at work in this. And you know how to brush teeth. So there's not much here that's new and exciting. So no new principles to learn. Let's take a look at the care plan. At the top of page 93, you can see the care plan. It tells you a resident with natural teeth is lying in bed and needs mouth care. The resident is not able to provide their own mouth care. This is important. A resident with natural teeth is lying in bed. Is that a safe position for mouth care? So what do we need to do? Put the bed up. Put the bed up. Now, Depends on the level of uh, um, ability of your patient. The patient might be able to sit up on the side of the bed. You might have to put the head of the bed up, right? It's what is the level of the patient. I'm going to tell you for the test, you're going to put the head of the bed up. But we have to think about that just a little bit, okay? Because is that bed controller, the controller that works the bed, do you think that's clean or dirty? Yeah, it's um, touched by everybody. So do you think we want to touch that with hands that are going to go into somebody's mouth? Yeah. So we have to think about when we're going to do this and how we're going to do it. Now, I'm going to show you the video for this one, but there is a change. So I want to talk about that change really quickly until I get the new videos done. In the video that I'm going to show you, you're going to see me put the head of the bed up before I wash my hands. We don't do that anymore. The reason we did that is because I know the bed controller is not clean. So once I get the head of the bed up, I go wash my hands and get rid of all of that. So it's kind of an infection control thing. But remember I said that we can't touch the patient until we have clean hands. So I can't put the head of the bed up until I wash my hands. So that, that creates a problem. So the way we're going to do this so this is really important. Your step-by-step -step instructions in the book are right. But the way we're going to do this. <coughs> Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to brush your teeth. Is that okay? Awesome. Close curtain. Go wash hands. And then I'm going to get a paper towel between my hand and the bed controller to put the, bed, the head of the bed up. So that's going to be a change. It's what's in your book. Step-by-step -step instructions are right. The video, until I get it retaped, is um, we're going to change that a little bit. Okay? All right. Remember that laying down is not a safe position. <coughs> if you don't raise the head of the bed, the patient may aspirate, which means breathing liquid into their lungs. That's a word you need to know. aspirate. It may be on your written exam. So on the step-by-step -step instructions, you're going to see we're going to do our opening, close our privacy curtain, wash our hands, put the barrier on the other bed, overbed table, <coughs> get your supplies, and then we'll use a paper towel to raise the head of the bed to a full sitting position. So a paper towel between our hands and the bed controllers so that we don't accidentally contaminate our hands. And then we're going to adjust the pillow behind the patient. 
you do want to offer, <coughs> man, there's something stuck in my throat. You do want to offer a um, towel over their chest so that we don't drip toothpaste on it. Patient may not want it, and that's okay, but we're, we are going to offer. In most cases, um, they will allow it because sitting up in bed, the toothpaste is going to drip down. We always wet a toothbrush before we put toothpaste on. That allows that toothpaste to spread evenly. And we're just going to brush. Top, bottom, front, back, tongue. No time requirement here. You don't have to brush for two minutes. Nothing like that. Just get the top, get the bottom, get the front, get the back, get the tongue. We don't care what order. Just get them all. Don't use a lot of toothpaste. Your patient has to rinse. If you use a lot of toothpaste, they're going to be rinsing forever. So a little pea size amount is all we need. Um, make sure you dry the mouth off after. And this step gets missed all the time on the test. Don't forget to dry their mouth off. And you want to make sure that their clothing is dry at the end as well. So these are our checkpoints. Patient must be sitting fully upright. We're going to protect their clothing. We'll wet the toothbrush before we apply toothpaste. Brush all surfaces, allow the patient to rinse and spit, and leave the patient's face and clothing dry. Those are the important checkpoints for this skill. <coughs> so a common question is, do I have to brush everybody's teeth? That's kind of gross. And the answer is no. If somebody can brush their own teeth, trust me, they will. I'm not going to come to your house at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning, knock on your door, and say, open up. Because you know how you can brush your own teeth. You're physically capable. You know how. You don't need my help. A patient that can brush their own teeth and doesn't need your help, you're not going to brush their teeth. But we do need to know how to do this for people that can't brush their own teeth. So this is an important skill to learn, but it's not one that you're going to be doing on everybody. We're always going to follow that care plan. So our step-by-step -step instructions are located on page 93, and they tell us exactly how to do this skill. So let's watch how this is done. Remember, there is a change. We're going to put the head of the bed up after we wash our hands. We're going to use a um, paper towel. Hello. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. How are you? Wonderful. I need to do mouth care. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to put the head of your bed up. And then I'll close the curtain, wash my hands, and gather my supplies. Okay. We'll get you to a full upright sitting position for safety. And if I can get you to lean forward, please. There you go. Is that more comfortable? Yeah, it's much. Okay, I'm going to close your curtain and wash my hands now. I'll gather my supplies. I'm going to start with a barrier, and we'll place that on your overbed table. I'm going to get a towel, a set of gloves, a basin, toothbrush and toothpaste, and a cup of water. We'll prepare the toothbrush first. We'll get it wet, place a little bit of toothpaste on it, and set it in the basin. Mr. Jones, can I place this towel over your chest? Yes, please. Okay. And now I'll apply my gloves. Okay. 
Okay, Mr. Jones, can you open wide for me? I'm going to brush the back on the bottom. The back on the top. And can you bring your teeth together? And stick your tongue out for me. Thank you. Set that aside. Go ahead and take a sip. Rinse your mouth. Let me wipe that off for you. Another sip. No, thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to dispose of my cup, wrapper, and toothbrush. I'll be right back. I'm going to remove the towel and place it into dirty linen. I'm going to go clean the basin and I'll be right back. I'll place the toothpaste in the basin, use the paper towel to open the drawer, and place the basin and toothpaste in the drawer. I'll clean up my work environment and go throw these items away. Now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, A magazine? Baby. No, thank you. Okay, your call light is right here. If you should have any needs, let me know. Can I adjust the head of the bed for you? No, this is great. Okay. I'm going to open the curtain and go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about my skill, make any corrections I need to make, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right. Any questions on that? Yes. You don't have to lower the bed. At the end, I asked, would you like the head of the bed uh, lowered? And he said, no, he's fine. So at the end of the scale, the head of the bed is comfort, whatever they want. Okay. But if I did need to lower it, it would just be before I went and washed my hands at the end. Um, on the <clears> test, <throat> will we have to be a patient like, for the first Yes. Yes. You may be a patient for this skill. It is a live patient skill. <clears throat> I know it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Yeah. And nobody wants anybody else in their mouth. I, I get it. Um, but, you know, if somebody's testing, they need somebody to demonstrate this on. So, And it's good for you guys, too. And I think this is an important component of this. <clears throat> it is good for you guys to be a patient for every one of these skills. You need to know what it's like to have this done on you. That's an important part of training. Okay. Any other questions? All right, moving on. Page 54. Uh, LaVon says, Patty, you're a godsend watching from Inverness, Florida. Oh, right up the road. Welcome. And Gloria, sa Gloria says, good evening, Miss Patty and everyone. Good evening wherever you are. And Candace says, Miss Patty is an amazing teacher and instructor, very knowledgeable. Thank you for all you do. Oh, thank you very much, Candace. I really appreciate that. Thank you guys for joining. All right. <clears throat> so this is going to be page 54. We are going to measure and record respirations. So if you look at the principles involved, there's nothing really new to learn here. We know our skill rules. We're going to follow the we're going to do our opening. Every skill starts with the opening. Every opening starts with a knock. We're going to evaluate if we need gloves. 
We have restoration specific steps we're going to go over in a minute, and we're going to do the closing. I have a video on this at the bottom of this uh, page. You can see test specific information. You should be able to perform this skill in five minutes or less. It will be on another live testing student, so you might be a patient for this. That person will be laying in bed. Charting is required. Normal values are between 12 and 20, and you can be off by two breaths in either direction and still be accurate. If you're making your own flashcards, this gray box up here are kind of like the cliff notes, the short version of how to do this skill. So you should be making flashcards of those. Our flashcards already have these in there. <clears throat> All right, no new principles learned, just skill specific. So let's take a look at the care plan on the top of page 55. Our care plan tells us patient will be lying in bed for skill. Count the patient's respirations for one full minute and record your readings. So they're going to be laying down in bed. We're going to count their breathing for one full minute and record it. Big part of this is we don't want to tell somebody we're counting their respirations. If we tell somebody we're counting their breathing, it makes them hyper aware of their breathing and they either stop breathing, they hold their breath, or they start breathing rapidly because now they're anxious. So we don't want to tell them, I'm counting your breathing. What we're going to say instead is, I'm here to take your vital signs. So we're not lying. Respirations is part of vital signs. We're not lying to them. But we don't just want to um, alter their breathing by telling them what we're counting. We don't want to make them hyper aware of it. <laughs> In and out counts as one breath. So okay. In and out counts as one breath, but it doesn't matter whether you start in the middle or if you start on the inhale or you count on the exhale, doesn't matter. The whole thing counts as one. So if you start counting and they're exhaling, it counts. Okay, make sense? If you end counting on an inhale, it counts <laughs> because that it counts as one. The whole cycle counts as one. Make sense? Good. <clears throat> Okay, so how long do you count? Easy answer. Whatever the care plan tells us to. This care plan tells us one full minute. That means we're going to look at the clock, pick a starting point. We're going to count how many times the patient breathes until that second hand gets right around back to that starting point, and we're going to say stop. This is just like pulse. The evaluators need to know when you start counting and when you stop counting because they're going to count at the same time. <clears throat> If the care plan, just like Pulse, does not specify, you can count for 15 seconds and multiply that by four <coughs> to get your full reading, just like with Pulse. Normal values are between 12 and 20. That's how many times most people breathe every minute, between 12 and 20. But breathing isn't exaggerated like I just did, <sighs> right? <clears throat> breathing is easy, even very quiet, uh, kind of hard to see, hard to hear. If you can see respirations really easily, we have to let the nurse know something's wrong there. If we can hear respirations really loudly, they're wheezing, they're gurgling, they're sighing loudly, the nurse needs to know because that's not normal. Okay, but normal is between 12 and 20. Let's talk about documentation. This is on page 48. In most settings, most, not all, but most settings, CNAs do not document words. CNAs are limited to documenting numbers, pulse, respirations, blood pressure, um, how much the patient ate, you know, check off a box, 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%. You might write numbers in for how much they drank, 120 mLs, 240 mLs. But usually in most settings, CNAs don't write words like 
I noticed the patient was limping today, right? You won't be allowed to write words in most settings. And that's because documentation is a legal document. So <clears throat> if the facility gets sued, all medical records get called into the courtroom and they can be used against you. Now, you don't have enough knowledge, legal knowledge, to be able to write something in words that could be held against you. But if you're working in a setting that does require word documentation, they're going to train you how in that setting. Remember, you can be trained to do other things. The biggest thing I want you to remember is to limit the use of I statements. And you only report what you see, hear, smell, or feel. You don't interpret it. So you wouldn't want to say, I think the patient has a UTI. First of all, it's an I statement. The focus is on you, not the patient. The second thing is you don't have qualification or um, credentials to think. So it would be better to say urine noted to be dark with a foul odor. Okay. Nurse notified. <clears throat> now that takes you out of it. There was no I statement in there. You're not saying what you think about those observations. You're just giving the observations and what you did. Do you guys understand the difference? If you're going to use Word documentation, you want to be accurate. But you want to be brief. You don't want to write this whole long, I was walking down the hallway and Miss Mary called out to me, right? It's not a story. Brief. Short as possible. You do want to give the complete story, though. So you wouldn't want to say urine was noted to be dark and um, small amounts. You wouldn't want it because what did you do with that? You need to be complete nurse notified. You need to be complete. Documentation is usually done in black ink. But again, you'll follow your policy and procedure. Um, never pencil. We don't erase anything. We don't white out anything. We don't scribble over anything. And we never use a Sharpie to take anything out of the medical records. If you make a mistake, and guys, I have done this in my career, charted a whole half page on somebody and it was in the wrong chart. Oh, you can't get rid of it. You can't take that page out and throw it away. It's a legal document. You don't have the right to destroy legal evidence. So all you do is take your pen one line through everything that's inaccurate and then you write error and your initials. So error, wrong chart. You know, if it was the wrong chart, error, your initials. Um, you don't, everybody still needs to be able to see it. You can't remove it. Okay. But you can draw a line through it, put error in your initials, okay? You only chart what you did. If you gave a bed bath, I can't chart that the bed bath was given. You can only chart what you did. Um, that's really, really important. And make sure that you're charting when it occurred. Let me tell you a story about this. Oh. I was a hospice case manager for several years and we had a CNA that was working overnight. The patient was actively dying and she was sitting there overnight bored. Nothing is going on. The patient's actively dying. They're, it's just very quiet and boring and she was trying to stay awake. So they had to do 15 minute checks. So every 15 minutes she had to write down what was going on with the patient. You know, patient resting quietly, no signs of pain. Patient uh, turned onto her left side, no signs of pain. You know, whatever, but every 15 minutes. So she was bored and tired and trying to stay awake. So she just went through and do pre documented for the next four or five hours her 15 minute checks. Patient died. Now I've got a legal document in front of me that says at 4.15, this patient was resting quietly with no signs of pain when she died at 
and that's a legal document. That's a problem because that CNA is swearing that at 4.15, this patient was breathing, but the patient died at 2.30. Don't pre-document. You document when the task was done. Does that make sense? Good. Very important. That CNA got into a lot of trouble because that facility, hospice, was liable for what was in the chart. That patient had to have, this is how serious it is, that patient had to have an autopsy because the documentation did not match the evidence. So now it looks like foul play. That's how serious this is. And the CNA felt horrible. All I was trying to do was stay awake. I understand. But this is legal. You can't mess with that. This is serious. Make sense? Good. All right. So there's a whole lesson here about documentation. You will have one or two questions on the state exam about this lesson. You will have a documentation question on the state exam. So you need to make sure that you read that. So here is our step-by-step -step instructions for this skill. Care plan is up at the top. We've already read it, but it says, patient will be lying in bed for this skill. Count the patient's respirations for one full minute and record your readings. Supplies are at the bottom. You've got a couple questions there that you can look at to make sure that you've got the concept. All right. So let me have a volunteer, somebody to come lay down in this bed for me, please. All I'm going to do is count your respirations. Yeah. Just turn it manually. Take me too long to set that up. Okay, go ahead and lay down for me if you would. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, that might make it a little bit easier for them to see, if you don't mind. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little trick when you're performing this skill. And I'm going to tell you what you don't want to do but I need her laying down to show this. She, you can keep them on. It's fine. There we go. Okay. So there's a problem with respirations. Okay. If I'm going to count her respiration, she's laying in bed. Remember laying down is vulnerable. Undressed is vulnerable. So she's feeling pretty vulnerable right now. Now, if I come up and I do my opening, knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to get your vital signs. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands. And then I come over and I stare at her. Remember how long a minute was? How comfortable are you right now? <laughs> Not. You can't just stare at somebody without talking to them. That's really high on the creep meter. So we can't do that. Instead, I'm going to make her think I'm taking her pulse. So if I, and my hands are cold, I'm sorry. If I hold her wrist, remember elbow on the bed, not like this, right? Elbow on the bed. If I hold her wrist, I do not have her pulse. I'm literally holding her hand, okay? I'm holding her wrist, but now, is this more comfortable for you? It is, right? Isn't that weird? You can't just stand and stare. It's creepy. But holding the wrist makes the patient much more comfortable. If you make the patient anxious, that's going to elevate their heart rate and their breathing. So we're not going to get an accurate reading. We want to, to um, make sure that this feels very normal for them. Good? Now, there's something else you can use on the state exam to make this easy. So her tummy is going to go up and down as she breathes. So I know this is uncomfortable, but everybody's going to stare. <laughs> and you can see her tummy go up and down as she breathes. 
it's hard to see, like, especially from way over there, it's hard to see the up and down. Well, if I do this, now you can see it. I did not change her breathing. I changed your ability to see it. This, I actually use psychology on you, believe it or not, because your eye is drawn to movement when it's a contrasting color. By putting an alcohol pad on her tummy, it's a contrasting color. And now you can see the up down of her breathing. You guys see that? Pretty cool. You can use that on the state exam. Because for the test, you don't want those evaluators in your space. You want them on the other side of the room while you're testing. So put an alcohol pad on their tummy and the evaluators stay away. Because now they can see the breathing from a, a far distance. Good? Now, the reason we use alcohol pads rather than anything else, they're mystical, magical, and medical. If I put anything else on her tummy, she's going to ask, why is that there? What are you using that for? But if I put an alcohol pad on her tummy, she is less likely to ask. Because she assumes I'm going to use it for something medical later. They're not. Patients associate these with medicine. It's lightweight, so it doesn't affect her breathing. This is the best thing to use. If you put a pen on there, they're going to ask why is a pen. Because most people don't walk around with pens on their tummies. Okay. If you put your hand on there to feel that's a little too intrusive. It also lets them know that we're counting their respirations, which will change the respirations. And it's just a little bit too personal of contact. Does that make sense? So don't put your hand on there. Use an alcohol pad and make them think that you're counting their pulse. So we're going to do this for one full minute. I'm going to do this whole Skill. I'm going to do my opening, go over, wash my hands, come back here. I'll pick a starting point on the clock. I'm going to say start out loud. And you guys are going to count how many times her tummy goes up and down. You're going to count her respirations until I say stop. And then I'll do my closing and I will write down my reading. After I write down my reading, we'll see how close you guys got. And you can be off by two breaths in either direction. And hopefully at home, you guys can play along. I don't know how well the camera will pick it up, but maybe I can zoom in. Let's see if we can zoom in. Oh, all right, well. All right, people at home, we'll see how well you can do with that. And my documentation form is right here on the table for after I um, count. Here we go. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. How are you? I'm your CNA today, and I need to take your vital signs. Is that okay? All right, I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands, and I'll be right back. So I'm going to go over to the sink. I know you guys at home can't see me. I'll walk you through this. I'm going to turn the water on, wet my hands. Get some soap, but we want a lot of soap because bubbles count. We're going to bring our hands together and start rubbing and look at the clock. I'm going to rub the tops of my wrists, the backs of my hands, in between my fingers, in between my thumb and index finger, the bottom of my hand by my pinky, and the palm of my hand interlacing the fingers for at least 20 seconds. And that was 20 seconds. So I'm going to go down each one of my nails to clean the cuticles. I'm going to circle my nails on the palm of my hand to clean underneath, keeping my hands lower than my elbows. And then I'm going to rinse. While rinsing, I want to be careful not to touch the faucet or the sink. After rinsing, I'm going to tap, keep the water confined to the sink. And then I'll get some paper towels and dry what's clean. We're going to use a clean, dry paper towel to turn the water off. Now I have clean hands. 
All right, Mrs. Jones, I'll need you to remain quiet during this time. It'll take me about a minute, but I'll let you know when I'm done, okay? All right, let me hold your wrist here. Can everybody see? You guys see? Are you ready? Ready, set, start. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Would you like a magazine before I go? Okay, are you comfortable? So the bed is in the low position. My environment is clean. She is safe. I'm going to go ahead and open that. And where is the call light? There it is. Okay. Here's your call light. If you need anything, just press that red button. I'm gonna go wash my hands. So I'm coming over to the sink. I wanna turn the water on, wet my hands, get lots of soap, bring them together and look at the clock. I'm going to rub the tops of the wrists, the backs of the hands in between the fingers, in between the thumb and index finger, that webbing, the bottom of the hand by the pinky, and the palm of the hand interlacing my fingers for at least 20 seconds. And that is 20 seconds. So I'm gonna go down each one of my nails, circle the nails on the palm of my hand, and rinse. Being careful to keep my hands lower than my elbows and not touch the sink or the faucet. Okay, I'm gonna tap, keep the water safely in the sink. Get some paper towels, dry what's clean. We'll throw those away, get a clean dry paper towel to turn off the faucet. Now I'm going to document on the documentation sheet that the evaluator has provided. I'm gonna write down my reading. After documenting, I'm gonna go wash my hands again. So I'm gonna come over to the sink, turn the water on, wet my hands, get some soap, bring them together, look at the clock. I'm gonna wash the tops of my wrists, the backs of my hands in between my fingers, in between my thumb and index finger, the bottom of my hand by my pinky, the palm of my hand in between the fingers. I lost track, so that's 20 seconds. Now I'm gonna go down each one of my nails to clean my cuticles, circle my nails on the palm of my hand, keeping my hands lower than my elbows, and rinse. Being careful not to touch the faucet or the sink. I'm gonna tap, keep the water in the sink, get some paper towels to dry what's clean. Throw those away, clean dry paper towels to turn the faucet off. Now I would go back to my care plan right there on the screen. I'm gonna to go to that care plan. I'm gonna read it one more time. Care plan tells me patient will be lying in bed for the skill, count the patient's respirations for one full minute and record your readings. I'm pretty happy I did that. Nothing I need to change, no corrections I need to make. So I'll tell the evaluator now my skill is done. Thank you very much. 
So what numbers did you get? Okay. So if you got 18, you can go ahead and have a seat. If you got 18, 19, 20, 21, or 22, you are accurate. I got 20. Okay. Did you notice, I don't know whether you paid attention to this. Did you notice when she, when we first started counting, her respirations were fast. And then toward the end, they started to slow down. Do you know why? Yep, she knew that we were counting that her respiration. She also knew she was on camera, so she was anxious. Yep. But after a minute, that anxiety kind of died down a little bit and her, sl her breathing slowed. So if we had only counted for 15 seconds and then multiplied that by four, we would have gotten a much higher number. Does that make sense? This is why sometimes your care plans are going to tell you one full minute because we know the patient's anxious and we want an average as the breathing slows. Good. <laughs> Questions? Okay, so we are now going to go to test registration. So um, you're going to have to give me just a few minutes to get all of these printed off because I'm going to print off the registration forms now. So you've got about a five-minute break. Don't go far, um, but in about five minutes, we're going to go through. I'm going to give you the test registration uh, documents, and we're going to go through them together along with the timeline. Okay, so you've got about five minutes.
guys it's a lot of printing huh i said you're printing a treat yes there's seven pages to the registration and there's 10 of you so so what are we going to throw it out today we're going to go over it you're not actually going you're going to fill out some of it today um the important parts that i don't want you to get wrong but your demographic information and stuff like that you can fill out on your own We'll go over it, but you don't have to fill it out here. Um, and then you'll submit it when you are ready. So some of you have to wait for paychecks. Some people have to wait for um, vacations to be over. Some have to wait for, you know, whatever your reason is. You can then um, apply or, you know, register when you are ready. You'll be able to, you can register right away. So you can take this and, and register today. We're going to go over the timeline in just a few minutes, but you should be from the time that you register until testing is usually about three to four weeks. Okay, so if you register today, when I give this to you, you should be testing about a week or two after graduation, which is perfect timing. It allows you long enough that you will be able to practice and get secure in your skills but not so long that you forget what I've said. And some of this I'm filling out for you because I want to make sure that you get it right. We're also going to go over fees and all of that in just a few minutes. 
So let me pass these out to you. This is a whole packet. So everything, I'm going to go over a ton of information with you today, and I'm going to go kind of fast, and you're not going to get everything I say, so you need to know where to go for the answers. So if you go on to foryourcna.com, which is my main website, under the testing tab, I have test registration instructions. Same tab, I also have background screening, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. Okay, so these two, you're gonna to need to know where to find. All right, so this paper, which is on top, is our timeline. It tells us steps. We have four steps to um, the CNA test registration. We're going to get our background check if you don't already have one, we'll talk about that in just a minute. We're going to submit our application after the background check. We're going to wait for an email from Prometric to make sure that the application was complete and that there's no issues with it. Once we receive that email that says our application was complete, then about 10 days later, you're going to get another email from Prometric with your test date. You do not get to choose your test date. They test seven days a week. They only take off major holidays. So President's Day, they were working. Valentine's Day, they work. Um, Good Friday, they work. It's only major holidays that they take off, okay? So seven days a week. You don't get to choose your test date. You're going to get one assigned to you. If that date doesn't work, you're going to pick up the phone, you're going to call Prometric and say, I can't make that date. And while they're on the phone with you, you will together choose a date that you can attend. Okay, don't wait until the day before testing to make that call. They will charge you. So the minute you get your test date, if it doesn't work, you need to let them know right away so you don't get charged for a, a rescheduling fee. Good? All right, so this is the website that I went to to print your registration off. You need to know this website. It's on your form. But Prometric.com slash NurseAid slash FL. In Florida, Prometric is the testing agency that does all CNA testing for the state. So this is Prometric's Florida testing website. There are several um, headings here. If you click on the heading, it opens up and you'll find more information. So when you click on candidate resources, this opens up 
And down here, it has information on the Florida Department of Health fingerprint vendor list. So if you don't know where to get your fingerprints, this is where you can find it. But I've got two listed here for you. In the first column under background screening, in the um, first box there, you can see that I've listed two for you for our area. Deontis is um, the UPS store on Barclay in Spring Hill by the Parkway. Identigo is over in Wesley Chapel. So if you, you know, by the outlet mall, those outdoor mall things. So if you want to go shopping, make an appointment there, it gives you a good excuse. There are other vendors that you can go to. You can open up the list and find others. But these two that I gave you seem to have the fewest problems. Okay. So I'm going to walk you through how to register on Deontis, which is the one in our local community, how to register for a background screen uh, appointment. So if you go to deontis.com, and you'll want to go back and watch this presentation when you're ready to do this. But you go to deontis.com, and we're going to have to create an account. So up here, you'll see create an account, or down here, you'll see register. Either one of those will bring this screen up. And we have to create an account to do a background check. You want to put your email and create a password. It's got to meet this criteria. Check the two boxes. And then you're going to get an email and you'll log in. Once you log in, then we, we, are, we have this screen. And this is where everybody gets stuck. So what do I choose here? You want to choose Florida Services. Florida Services. All of this is, um, you know, here. It gives you the, the website and everything that you need. But you need this code right here, EDOH0380Z. You need this code. No matter who you use to get your background check done, you have to have this code to make sure it's routed to the right place. So when we get... To, when we click on that Florida Services, this is the screen that comes up, and we need that ORI number in here. So we're going to type in EDOH0380Z right there under ORI. That's going to bring this up. So it reads that code, and it says, oh, you must be taking the CNA exam. So you're going to <laughs> make sure that here it says CNA by exam and hit next. Under request information, the reason we want other employment and licensing. We're going for a license. We need a licensing code. And then we're going to leave that OCA blank. This is where you're going to fill out all of your information, personal information. You're going to find a, a center near you. Again, our closest one is on Barclay and Spring Hill Drive. You'll make an appointment, so you can see, uh, You'll when they're open, you'll set an appointment, select a date, and they do like same day, guys, same day. You'll fill out, um, you'll find the time, you'll fill out your card information, and it's $76.68 if you're registering online. If you walk in, it's like 85 bucks. They're going to charge you an extra $20 to do a walk, for them to do this part. If you do it yourself, you're going to save money. Okay? All right. So when you go to that appointment, they're going to take your fingerprints, they're going to take a photo, and you're going to give a signature. And then you're going to leave. You don't get anything to go home with. You don't send anything anywhere. You go to the appointment, they do your fingerprints, photo, and signature, and that's it. You don't have to do anything else there. You're done with the background. They electronically submit it. So now that the background check is done, we're going to wait about 24 hours, and then we're going to register for the test. So we go to Prometric.com slash for your, 
Prometric.com slash nurse A slash FL. So we're going to go to this website. And that's where I got this. Under. Oh, <coughs> All right, let, all right, we'll come back to, to that in a second. When you go onto this website, there's a couple things I want to bring to your attention. This is their address right here, Prometrics address. It's also here under Contact Us. So if you want to fill this application out and mail it in, you can. This is their registration packet. Fill this out and mail it in. This is the address to mail it to takes a lot longer to do it that way. There's an online application that is this same form, just online that you type your information in, and that is way faster. If you mail this in, you can add about another two to three weeks for processing. If you enter the information yourself, it's about three to four weeks from application to test. Okay, this is the um, email address if you have any questions, but do you see this right here? If it has been more than five business days since you submitted an application and you have not received confirmation, please reach out by phone or email. So there's their phone number, there's their email. So they're telling you when you register for the test, if you don't hear from us within five days, you need to get in touch because there's a problem. Okay, good. And this is where their, their information is. So under application process, we have online application form, which is this online. And then there's a paper application, which I printed off for you. So you can actually see what's going to be asked here. And we're going to go through that together. So, um, Paper application is what you have in front of you. So this paper application looks like this. We're going to go through each section of this. So when you're looking at page one, there's a one down here. You'll notice there's seven pages to the registration form. When you're looking at page one, the first thing you'll see is this stop sign. And it's telling you, very important, you need two forms of ID to test. One of them has to have a picture and it has to be government issued. So a driver's license, a state ID, a passport, a military ID, those will all work. It has to be non-expired. So if you have an expired ID card, you cannot use it. It has to be government issued with a photo, non-expired. Now, I'm stressing that because I just had somebody go test about three weeks ago who, who went with an expired ID card and they refused to let them test. And they came back all upset. I make sure I tell you that it's non-expired. Okay. The second form of ID is going to be a signature ID. So your social security card has your signature on it. A library card often has your signature. A debit card that you've signed the back of it has your signature. So the second form of ID has to have a signature. <coughs> the names on both have to match exactly. Exactly. So if one of them says, um, Susie Carmen Lopez, and your um, on your social security card, but your driver's license has Susie Hayes Lopez because that was your maiden name. Those two can't go together. Okay, the names have to match. So make sure you pay attention to that. Down here, it's asking if you are going to be requesting Americans with Disability Act accommodations. So if you need a sign language interpreter, if you need a seeing eye dog, if you need additional time for the written test, 
If you have a physical or mental incapacity that would keep you from taking the test like everybody else, you need to fill this out. Check yes. But there's a whole test packet on this website that you have to download and take to your physician for confirmation. So those applications will take an extra four to six weeks of processing. Now, if you don't need ADA accommodations, check now. Now we're going to get on to demographics. So it's going to ask you, have you taken the CNA written or clinical since 2020 or 2002? Just check yes or no. You're going to put your name. Make sure you're write legit, writing legibly if you are going to mail this in. If, um, let me go back here. If you are going to fill this out online, just use this as a template, what we're going to fill out together. Top of page two is the rest of your demographic. And let's go down here to the bottom of page two, because this messes everybody up. If you have a felony in your background, a felony, you need to see me after class. <clears throat> if you have no felonies in your background, grab a pen. If you have no felonies in your background, grab something to write with. And at the bottom of page two, at the bottom of page two, question number one, I want you to check off no. Nothing else, just question number one, check no. If you have no felonies in your background, for question number one, check no. Leave A, B, C, D, and E blank. Do not answer them. If you answered no to number one, leave all the sub questions blank. Go to number two. If you have no felonies in your background for number two, check no. Okay. So if you have no felonies, you should have no for number one and number two, but nothing for the ones in between. Oops, let's go back here. Let's go to the top of page three, and there's more questions. Again, you left the A and B blank. Don't answer those. Go to question number three. And let me explain to you what question number three is. We had a problem a couple of years ago with um, doctors committing Medicare fraud. So they would bill for services they didn't provide. And they defrauded the federal government out of a lot of money. Their staff was just as guilty. If you worked for a doctor who defrauded the federal government, then you would have been taken to court and prosecuted. You would have been put on a list of people that cannot work in medicine. Everybody understand that? Questions three, four, and five are all about that list. If that does not apply to you, you're going to check off no for three, four, and five. Do not check off the A's, B's, C's, or D's. <clears throat> good? Everybody good? All right. So now we're going to go down to disciplinary history. What this is asking is if you've ever been a medical professional in Florida or any other state and you were investigated for misconduct. So if you lived in Indiana, were a CNA, slapped around some old people, got your license suspended, and now you moved to Florida and thought you'd do it here, they're going to find out about it. But they need you to self-declare. If you've never been a medical professional anywhere, your answers here to all four are going to be no. If you have been a medical professional, either in Florida or any other state, you need to read those questions and answer them accordingly. 
If you've never been a medical professional, the answer is no. Moving on to criminal history. There's only two choices here. You've either got one or you don't. If the answer is maybe, it's probably yes. Okay. Either you've got one or you don't. Now, these two questions at the bottom, the first is, ever, is asking if you've ever had any records sealed, expunged, removed from your criminal history. So you'd want to answer yes or no. And the last question there is answer, asking if you have a juvie record, a juvie record. We were all young and dumb. <laughs> Not all of us got caught. Okay. They're just asking, do you have a juvie record? Moving on to, question, or to page number four. I cannot help you with page number four. I'm actually preventing or prevented from helping you for page number four. You need to read those questions and input your social security number. I cannot help you with this page. So we're going to move on to page number five. All right, so if you, on this right here, this instruction sheet, you guys see that instruction sheet? Okay, right here, second column, highlighted, it says select E3 Challenger. So it's so important, I even put in big bold letters at the bottom, important, you must select E3 Challenger. Now, I don't expect any of you are listening to me, so I went ahead and checked off E3 Challenger. If you do the application online, what are you going to check? E3 Challenger. If you check anything else, it can prevent you from testing. E3 Challenger. Any of you guys previous CNAs that let your certification lapse and you're trying to get back in? Anybody? Okay, you guys are all checking E3 Challenger. If you were a CNA previously, you can check E5. Anything else is going to require verification before you can test and you don't have that. So E3 Challenger. Now we're going to go down to training information. If you notice, I put a big X through it. We're not going to fill that out. It tells us above this that we're only going to fill it out if we check E1 or E2. What do we check? E3, e3 does not apply to us. So let's go down here to test site information. I've already checked off regional test site. That's where you're going to be testing. And you have a lot of places that you can go test. So this is our test center list. There's actually three pages. Test center list. These are all the places in Florida that you can go take the CNA exam. Our closest one is in Tampa. We don't have anything local. There's nothing in Hernando or Pasco County. The closest one is in Tampa. If you're in Citrus County, your closest one is probably Ocala. So down here, right down here, you will see that I have Tampa by the airport. I have Tampa by 75 and I have Ocala. And next to each one of those <laughs> is a code. In here, you're going to write the code from the place that you want to test. If you're doing this online, if you're doing this application online, you don't need the code, there's going to be a drop down box. You just want to select the one like Tampa or Ocala, you want to select the one nearest to you. Okay? Good? All right. Um, you can get that test center list on Prometrics website. This is especially important for you guys at home. On Prometrics website, prometric.com slash nurse slash FL, under candidate resources is a test center list. 
So you can go get that list and go through it and find the testing center nearest you. There's testing centers in Miami. If you're a cruiser, eh, register for the test, schedule it in Miami. When you're done with the test, go jump on a cruise ship and celebrate, okay? So you've got lots of options. Okay, so this is the testing center list. You can see all the different testing centers that are available in Florida. All right, so now we're down to the actual test. So what kind of test do we want to take? And it's not as simple as just one test. There's lots of options here. So I need to go through this with you. The first one is a plain Jane test, the one 99% of people choose. The first option is a clinical skills and written in English, normal. First one is normal. But that doesn't meet everybody's needs. Some of you are going to need the computer to read the test questions to you. If you have a language barrier, if you have a reading problem, if you have um, ADHD and your brain just kind of goes all over and you need that additional reinforcement, you may need the computer to read the written test question and answer choices to you. If that's the case, you would choose the second option. It says with audio. Or I'm sorry, writ, um, written oral is what it says. Now, the other ones below that, you can ignore written, written, skills, skills, okay? Or written, written, skills, sorry. Written, written, skills, you can ignore those. That is if you need to retest. So if you go to the test and you pass the written and you fail the skills, you're gonna have to retake the test, but you only have to retake the portion you failed. So you would only have to retake skills, and that's why it's listed there. You can see if you have to retake the skills, it's $120. Let's not fail. Okay. They don't need any more of your money than they're getting. So we're going to do good. If you have to retake the written, it's asking, do you want to retake it in English or do you want the audio? So you would check the right box. Now, if you go down a little bit further, you see that you also have an option to take clinical skills in English and the written in Spanish. So the written is available in Florida in Spanish if Spanish is your primary language and you want to take the written test in Spanish. Skills is always done in English. Huh? I remember what? something. <laughs> okay. So you've got lots of choices, but the first one is the one that 99% of you will need. Off to the side, so you put a check mark there. Off to the side, you're going to write 155, and that is the cost of the test. That's what you have to pay to Prometric when you register. So that fee is due when you register. So if you go to the very last page, page 7, that's where you're going to write your payment information. So you would put your credit card or debit card number in there. If you're paying with a cashier's check, there's a place to put that number in there. They don't accept personal checks. So it has to be debit or credit card or cashier's check. Okay. Now, you already went through that. Okay, now go to page six. At the top of page six, you have to check a box that says yes. What you are saying yes to is that you have had an opportunity to review and read these two pages. These two pages, they're on Prometrics website. You can download them and read them. They're part of the online application. You can download them and read them. They're also up here laminated, so you can pick them up and read them. But this is their privacy policy. It tells you how they're going to use your information to clear you for testing. You have to check yes in this box that you have read these two pages, whether you read them or not is up to you, but you have to check the box, yes, if you did. It's right here, 
for you to read, or you can download it off their website and read it on your own. But you have to check yes in that box. Now below that is an attestation. You want to read these, and then you're going to sign and date. So you're going to read these, sign and date. And this is giving them permission to use you as an actor during the exam. It's also telling them that everything on this application is true and correct. And then you get down here, it tells you if you do not receive your emailed authorization to test. That's what ATT means. If you don't receive your authorization to test within 10 to 14 business days, contact from metric. So they're telling you that from the time that you apply, if you don't hear back from them within five days, you need to contact them. There was a problem. <coughs> if you don't get, if you get that email, but you don't get your test date within 14 days from the date you registered, 14 business days, you need to contact them. There was a problem. Okay. So they're telling you where your contact points are. This is important because I had a student not too long ago, last year, but not too long ago, who took my class, registered for the test, and never got anything from Prometric. She came back to me seven months later and said, you know, I never got anything from Prometric. And I, did you register? Yes. Did you get anything from them? No. Did you contact them? No. She had put her email address in wrong when she registered online. So all of those notifications were not coming to her. Her confirmation didn't come to her. Her test date didn't come to her. Her test date came and went months ago. And clearly she was a no-show for it. She didn't even know about it. Prometric would not refund her her money. She was out $155 because she did not follow the directions. If you don't hear from Prometric, you have to contact them. Okay? Good? Very important. All right, so when you get, when you register for the test, Three to five days, or one to three days, you're going to get an email from Prometric. Remember, if you don't get it within five, you contact them. But that uh, notice is going to have lots of boxes on it. You want to look to make sure it says application status complete. You also want to look at this area. It says FBI background status, this line. If it says there, record not found, they could not find your background check. Your application has stopped. This is why when you do the background check, you have to make sure you use that code to route it to the right place so Prometric can find it. Good. Questions? If it says record not found, your application is dead. You have to get a background check done. Why does it, why does it say if needed? Because some people are already working in medicine and they have a medical background check already on file and we can use that as long as it's medical. If you're a foster parent, that does not count. That background check doesn't count. If you have a concealed weapons permit, that background check does not count. If you work in finance, that background check does not count. If you work for the school board, that background check does not count. It has to be a level two photo enabled background check for medicine. What if we've had one before? In the last five years? Yeah. If, it, if you've got one in the last five years, they'll probably be able to pull it. There's no way for you to check. Okay. So you would want to register for the test and look in that square to see if it says record found or record not found. Okay. That's why it says if needed, because I don't know who has background checks and who doesn't. Um, so I just got my last name changed on my social. And I haven't changed it on my license yet. And I don't have a four license. I have an Alabama license. Would I need to get that changed and the new license before the background? Or could I do the background 
and then just do that before the the um, background check you're going to have to produce an ID that has the name that you're doing the background check under okay so it has to be my social <clears throat> name where I got changed to yeah but they're gonna need a photo ID for the background check yeah so I need to get my license basically. yeah okay yeah sorry <laughs> yeah we just moved here so. okay all right. All right. Again, if it's been more than five business days since you submitted your application and you did not get a, um, a confirmation, you need to get in touch with Prometric. Okay. Make sure that when Prometric sends you the um, your test date, that you open it and read it. <laughs> it's amazing how many people <coughs> use. Um, open all attachments from Prometric. All right. So we've gone over everything about test registration. We learned four skills today. We reviewed the skills that we learned up until this point. So we're, you're going to get a wrap-up email today that gives you links to all the videos that we watched and all the skills that we've learned. You can always watch the replay of today's class on YouTube. The link will be in the email. And if you haven't already, you want to make sure that you accepted the invitation to join the online course. But next class is Monday at 9, and I have a review sheet for you. <sighs> For those of you... Ooh, I don't have my... Oh, no. All right. Those of you who are playing along at home, remember that you have access to these review sheets. Um, I changed the color. It's not green. It's purple. Um, you have the um, access to these review sheets in lesson one of the online course, which is Unlock. So you do have access to this. So let me go ahead and hand these out. And on the back, of the review sheet, you'll see back here, you'll see the body systems that we went over in class today, as well as the new um, principle that we learned today as well. So if you're collecting these uh, review sheets, you have the principles on each one as we learn them. You're welcome. All right. Any questions on what we've covered in class today? Oops. Any questions on what we've covered in class today? Uh, so when you were talking about the medical, you know, the charting, why would they want to keep, like you said, you accidentally wrote somebody else's in their chart. Mm -hmm. Why would they want to keep, why would they want to keep it? Because it is a, a legal document. Yeah, you can't know. destroy it. But it's not for them. It doesn't matter. You can't destroy it. Okay. You're not allowed. It, it's, it's like going into a courthouse and throwing a legal file in the trash. So if they read it, like if it went to court and they, read, they, read, they would read that, what would they do with it? Just... They're going to just overlook it because it's an error. Caitlin, can you put that back up, please? Pretty please. Okay. One of the things that um, Caitlin put up here, um, I'm waiting. See if she, there it is. Um, this is a scrubs quiz that I created. It's called Cherokee-Scrubs.com. If you um, go onto that website, uh, it's a, there's a free quiz on there that will help you because you're getting, we're, we're now halfway through the program. We're getting ready to go to work. Okay, we should start thinking in those directions. But if you walk into my store, it is overwhelming the amount of scrubs and different styles and colors and, and uh, you know, do I want a 
drawstring waistband or a yoga waistband or, you know, what, what, what do I want? Oh my gosh, there's too many choices. This helps narrow it down for you. So it's going to ask you a couple questions and it will narrow down the choices and give you a very specific set that is meeting your criteria. So it's way easier to take two minutes to do this before you go into the scrub shop. So then you've got a something specific. I, you know, I want to try this on because it's going to meet the criteria that you set. Okay. So that's going to be very helpful for you, especially as you're transitioning into thinking about work. Speaking of work, I got an email just a few, a little bit ago. Let me pull it up for you. You want your pens. <clears throat> Okay, this came from Noemi Velez, N-O-E-M-I-V-E-L-E-Z. -E -E I am a recruiter with Home Instead looking in, or located in Spring Hill, Florida. We are looking for caregivers and would like to collaborate with your organization to see if you would be willing to post our hiring information on your jobs board for any student over the age of 21. This will be a good starting point for their career to get hands-on training and experience while they're pursuing their education with your organization. So they'll hire you now. <coughs> it's also a great opportunity for your students to work either part-time evenings or overnights while still having time for studying. We have a variety of shifts available with competitive pay. Attaches our flyer. We provide personal care, companionship, meal prep, light housekeeping, laundry, transportation to and from doctor's appointments for our clients. The company name is Home Instead. They're located at 8356 Forest Oaks Boulevard. The phone number 352-340-3500. And their website is www.homeinstead.com slash 774. So that is an employment opportunity for you. I will print that out and put it up on our employer board, but I wanted to let you know about that. Okay. Any questions? All right. You've got about 10 minutes of practice, not as much as I had hoped. Um, remember that we do have an ideal workplace quiz to help you identify where the right workplace for you is. You can find it on our four year CNA um, website. And it will be in a wrap-up email, either today's or next week's. I'm not sure which, but you'll get a link to it in our wrap-up email as well. All right. Any questions on what we've gone over? No? The rest of the class is yours. I'm going to go ahead and sign off uh, of YouTube. So uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. If you got any value out of it, please give us a thumbs up and let others know. And we will see you back in class on Monday at 9. Until then, happy caregiving. Bye. Caitlin, you can sign us off. <coughs>